All right, excellent. Well, we have a pretty full agenda, so I think I'll go ahead and get us uh, started off here. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here on a Saturday morning. I want to welcome everyone to this virtual discussion on K Awards in Ophthalmology and Vision Science. Uh, my name is Tom Johnson. I'm an assistant professor of ophthalmology and a glaucoma specialist at the Wilmer Eye Institute, and I'm in uh, year four of a K08 award. And I also want to introduce my colleague, Dr. Cindy Kai, uh, who will be co-moderating this session. She's an assistant professor at Wilmer. Uh, she did her residency here and then a Vitra Retno Fellowship at Duke uh, before returning to the faculty here uh, where she is doing a K-23 regarding the social determinants of health as it pertains to treatment and outcomes of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, so I want to start by just going over the goals of this meeting. Uh, I think what we want to do and achieve today is to come together and brainstorm ideas, uh, best practices, and really identify ways that we as a group and nationally can help promote the success of K award applicants and awardees. Uh, so to that end, I want to share the agenda for today. Um, and as you have already probably noticed, uh, this meeting has been set up on Zoom as a meeting rather than a webinar. And so this will allow everyone that's on the call, uh, whether you're a planned speaker or a, a participant in the audience, to actively participate by asking questions and getting involved in the discussion. Uh, but please also feel free to use the chat feature if you'd like. Uh, I also want to note that we have many speakers on the agenda here that are from the Wilmer Eye Institute, but we've also specifically included a number of participants that are from other institutions around the country. Uh, and as I noted before, we want all of the participants to also be a key part of the dis discussion. The goal here is to make the content of this webinar as generalizable to a broad audience of clinician scientists as possible. And the last thing is, as we progress through the content of today's discussions, I'd like for everyone to be considering whether it may be useful to think of this meeting today, bringing us all together, not as an end in and of itself, but maybe as a first step to something larger and more sustained. For instance, do you think it would be useful to create a social or professional network of K awardees in a more formal setting so that they can interact uh, more frequently, crowdsource ideas for overcoming common challenges or get to know one another better? Would it be useful to develop a network of K-mentors to share best practices for how to best mentor uh, their trainees and ensure the success of future clinician scientists? Would it be useful to form a standing committee that can help promote young clinician scientists and their work at national and international research meetings? Or are there other ways that we can leverage the collective wisdom of this experience group to augment the overall success of clinician scientists in ophthalmology in the coming years. So to that end, I'd like to get us started by introducing our first speaker, uh, Dr. Peter McDonald, who is the William Holland Wilmer Chairman of Ophthalmology at the Johns Hopkins Wilmer Eye Institute. And he's going to help set the stage by describing the importance of clinician scientists to ophthalmology, something that I know he's thought uh, very carefully and very deeply about. Peter, thanks for being here. Tom um, and Cindy, thank you for organizing today. And thanks for uh, to all of you who joined us, especially you West Coasters uh, that have gotten up early to be part of um, what, what I hope will be uh, a program that will be very helpful to you uh, young clinician scientists. Uh, at departments like mine, uh, we believe you're the future of our field and uh, the success of academic ophthalmology depends upon your success. And I wanted to give a little perspective from the uh, view of my department and my own personal experience as to uh, why uh, you should be in, hopefully encouraged and um, excited about the, the work that you're, uh, the path that your career is taking. Our founder, Dr. William Holland Wilmer was born during the Civil War in Virginia. He trained up in New York 
Time magazine in 1920 called him the greatest living eye surgeon. Uh, he was a great innovator, but he was also quite the academician, a general in the Medical Reserve Corps. He ran US Army Expeditionary Force hospitals in France during World War I, where at which time he wrote the first articles on the ocular effects of chemical weapons. He was also himself an aviator and he wrote the first or edited the first textbook on aerospace medicine. When the Wilmer Institute was created, he felt that it was crucial that in order to have outstanding education and patient care, that there had to be outstanding research. And so research became not an afterthought or an addition to Wilmer, but, but the Wilmer Institute views um, research as the way to make us better doctors and uh, better ophthalmologists. And um, <clears throat> after Dr. Wilmer, we had Dr. Woods down in the lower left. And Dr. Woods was, uh, I guess you, you, you could sort of say a father of the field of uveitis and ocular inflammation. And then uh, upper left was uh, Dr. A. Edward Mominy, credited with uh, describing immunologic graft rejection uh, in the cornea as, as the first essentially uh, described example of um, allograft rejection. And then my chairman in the upper right, Arnold Patz, of course, received the Alaska Award uh, for his work uh, looking at uh, what was then called RLF, retrolental fibroplasia. And, um, and then uh, Dr. Morton Goldberg was a, a leading light in recognizing the genetic contributions to eye disease. All of these gentlemen themselves are clinician scientists, all have published hundreds of papers. Um, if you read the peer-reviewed literature and go on PubMed and look up physician scientists, you will see a distressingly large number of articles like this one, the physician scientist, an endangered breed, question mark, the vanishing physician scientist, another one, the vanishing physician scientist, a critical review and analysis where we're told that uh, uh, it's not really possible for clinician scientists to compete for grants with their PhD track peers. And uh, here's, uh, turns out COVID made it even worse, the endangered physician scientist and COVID-19. So there, there's uh, so much um, similarity in terms of the, uh, the titles and the verbiage used in these articles that I would not blame someone considering going down the pathway of becoming a clinician scientist as thinking they're making a big mistake that uh, I, and I've actually had people tell me the clinician scientist is going the way of the dinosaur. And I have had department chairs, friends of mine who I know who are uh, not uh, unintelligent people tell me that they would never hire a clinician scientist because in their view, um, a clinician scientist cannot compete with the full-time a PhD basic scientist for a competitive grant funding. So um, <clears throat> if you're a K awardee on this call, you may be thinking, and a clinician scientist, you may be asking yourself whether you made a mistake. And I would like to strongly, strongly send the message that departments like Wilmer, uh, and there are, as you know, a number of them around the country, we're, we're all in on the idea of uh, that clinician scientists underpin the future of academic ophthalmology. My own personal experience as a Wilmer resident involved Alfred Summer uh, doing his work on vitamin A, looking at its efficacy in preventing xerophthalmia, only to discover the dramatic impact that it had in reducing childhood mortality in the developing world. And also my chairman, Arnold Patz, who I mentioned, who received the Lasker Award for his work in uh, retrolental fibroplasia, now retinopathy of prematurity, and also uh, a pioneer in understanding and treating diabetic 
retinopathy and the use of the argon laser in treating retinopathy and treating glaucoma. And uh, I, I had the privilege of going to the White House when Dr. Patz received the Medal of Freedom for uh, his work. I can tell you, a naive person that I was, when I, by the time I finished my residency in Baltimore, I don't believe I'd ever met an ophthalmologist who did not do research and publish. I did not know there were ophthalmologists that did not do research and publish. And you'll hear from some of my faculty uh, who trained me when I was a resident. And I thought it was uh, the rule rather than the exception. So uh, do not, please do not feel that you made any sort of a career error by uh, going down the clinician scientist pathway. Our patients completely are uh, bought in, literally bought in to the importance of uh, research in our field. And this is our research building at uh, Wilmer. Uh, it's about 10 years old, funded entirely by contributions from grateful patients. And uh, so this is the home of many, if not most of our clinician scientists. And you'll hear from a number of them today. Uh, and I'm not gonna tell you that it's easy being a young clinician scientist, uh, competing for funding and competing for a mind share against some of the most senior successful uh, academic uh, clinician scientists in ophthalmology, as well as basic scientists uh, that you're competing with. But, um, but I would strongly encourage you to believe that um, the future is bright, that departments like mine are constantly on the lookout for uh, brilliant young clinician scientists to uh, add to our faculty. And I think you'll hear today about some of the efforts that departments like mine have been uh, undertaking to provide uh, necessary resources to help you early on in your careers and help make sure that you're successful. So Tom and Cindy, uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, speak to the group today and congratulations to all you young people. Uh, you, you, you've done the right thing by choosing the career scientist pathway and I wish you every success in your careers. Thanks Peter for kicking us off. Uh, next, we have Dr. Neeraj Agarwal, who's the program director at the National Eye Institute overseeing the training grants, including the K grants. He's going to give us the program director's perspective on the NEI K grant process and program. All right. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes. Wonderful. And can you uh, let me uh, recall? You, you can all see my slides now, is it right? Looks great. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Tom and Cindy, for having me here this morning. And I feel so special among you all. I might have done something really good deeds in my previous life that I'm having to have you all's company here this morning. Uh, so today, uh, I thought uh, I will be talking about NEI Mentored Career Development Opportunities, uh, Loan Repayment Program for Early Career Clinician Scientists and other programs. So I have taken liberty because there are some new uh, initiatives we have started at NEI. So I said this is a good platform for me to talk a little bit about those. So before I go, this is uh, the, the QR codes for NEI strategic plan and funding for training and career development. So here is the, uh, uh, for the career development and this is for the strategic plan. Before I go, so we have a new sheriff in town at Clayton. Pardon me, Ed, he's here in the audience today and uh, he's a new training officer. He's going to be helping me or we are going to be working together. And Ed and I will share the training portfolio. So you might have noticed that some of your uh, K grants may have transferred to Ed. So don't worry about it. Nothing will change. Ed and I are there to, to talk about it. 
So Ed comes to us uh, from uh, Princeton Neuroscience Institute, where he served as the director of training and professional development, and later the assistant director of the institute. Prior to that, he oversaw a science grant program at Autism Speaks and served as a scientific review officer at the Center of Scientific Review here at NIH. So he's very well qualified and, and, and he's a great guy. So please uh, help him out. So what are the realistic mechanisms of grants for clinician scientists? As most of you know, because you are all sending me all the good grants of K08, K23, K99, R00. Those are the early career uh, grants for clinician scientists. And those who are involved in K23 in mentored patient-oriented uh, research, they may be interested also in R34, which is a clinical clinical uh, trial planning grant, uh, which is important, you know, like if you are interested in uh, going out of clinical trials, you know, then you can write this planning grant and they give you money for two years and then you plan and then you come back with a full-fledged clinical trial. Then of course, the coveted R01 is important. And recently we added R38, which is a stimulating access to research in residency STAR program. I will be talking a little bit about that. And of course, the institutional career development grant K-12, uh, which is being run by Harry very, very nicely. What are the unique features of K08? The K08 provides support for an intense uh, mentored research career development experience in biomedical behavioral, including translational research leading to research independence. Uh, whereas the K23, it involves uh, 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 to develop independent research skills in conducting patient-oriented clinical research, but we don't allow a phase three clinical trial. As I mentioned, it's important at that time, if you are interested in clinical trials, you be able to write R34 and then get into a full-fledged clinical trial. So what are the common features for K08, K23 career awards? The trainee eligibility is one has to be MD, OD, DVM, DO, and they are dual degrees, citizens and permanent residents only. So you have to be a US citizen. And also you have to have a finished residency in US, those who are foreign graduates, then you have a license to practice medicine in US. Second one is mentor is the most important commodity for an K award. You have to identify mentor early in your uh, career so that you can you know, write your K award and mentor can vouch for you. You require 75% or greater effort, which has changed now for uh, surgeons, which is now 50% to 75% and more. So you can lower your effort 50% if you are involved in surgical uh, aspects of uh, retina, et cetera. Salary, we have no cap except for the mandated cap of uh, congressional. Uh, justification. So research dollars are 25 to 30K and we provide 8% indirect cost. Usually we give it for five years. If on K-12 we have started one or you have spent one or two years on, uh, on K-12, then we give you a max of six years of uh, your individual K. It's non-renewable and there are three received date per year, which is in February, June, and October. Review criteria for the K08 and K23 uh, candidates potential. You are the most important uh, person in that grant application. It's a, it's a package deal, your career development plan, what you plan, how you want to advance your career, appropriateness of statements by mentor, co-mentors, consultants, and collaborators. All those letters are very, very important and your mentor's letter is, is the most important because then he, he or she can write about you and how good you are. Research plan is also equally important, but it's not the most important thing as for your R01 grant where you are totally uh, you know, uh, reviewed based on your research, research plan. Environment and institutional commitment, which is important. Again, 
Uh, the chair, like Peter McDonald, has to vow that you will be given 75% or 50% uh, time, free time towards research. Then the other review criteria are human vertebrate animals and select agents, uh, relevant biological variables such as sex. And then the other uh, non-scorable uh, items are training in responsible conduct of research and authentication of key biologicals. What did I do here? Oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> so, so as I said, uh, like two years ago, I think we, we reduced the, the requirement for effort 50% for, for surgical speciality. So you don't have to commit 75% or more because we realize that in surgery, you need to develop your surgical skills as well as your research uh, career. So here is the data for K award is success rate. I have uh, plotted here from 2017 to 2022. Blue is K08, then K23 is orange and green is K99, which is not important here at this point. Uh, so you can see here, you know, our funding rates are usually from say 30% to, to 40, 45%, you know, depending on the year and the number of applications received. Etc. So it's a pretty good success rate, and we try to do as much as we can, depending on the availability of the money. So here is the the data for uh, percentage of K awarded by NEI research program. So here I have comp compared here that uh, NEI research project grants portfolio. So for R01 and RPGs, R21, et cetera. So the retina is the biggest, largest program, which where we funded 44%. And if you compare that to NEI case portfolio, it is 37%, so which is kind of same pattern as the RPGs. And then the cornea is 13% for RPG and 15% for uh, K awardees and 6% for lens, 7% for lens in, 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 in RPG, 22% for glaucoma, which is expected, you know, because the clinicians are involved, but 10% is there in RPG, and 24% in SAVP here for the case, and then 23% uh, for the RPG, and 3% and 2% for uh, low vision portfolio. So here is the R01 success rates of K awardees, and I have plotted, I mean, I've included the data from 2012 to 2022. So uh, number of awardees applied for R01 or equivalent grants for K0851 and K23 is 29. The number of awards funded for R01 or equivalent is 60, 26, which is 49%, and 16, which is 55%. And the average number of years to get first R01 was 1.3 years for K08 and one year for K23. So, so before I do that, uh, the K23 data is a little bit skewed because many of you go into clinical trial route, et cetera. So I have not, this data doesn't include uh, those uh, investigators which have chosen to go in the other direction with their K23, number one. And number two is, it is too early for the, the, the clinicians who got their K award in 2020, 2021, 2022 to get their first R01 because they are still in the midst of their K award. So they may not even submit their R01. So the data could be better. So, so this is how it looks and it's very good. So here are some of the things which you are supposed to know, which might help you to get some administrative supplements. So this is the NOT-OD-23-031. This is the administrative supplements to promote research continuity and retention of NIH mentored career development K award recipients and scholars. So uh, those of uh, you who had some uh, if you had a childbirth, uh, if you are a woman, then you have, if you took care of ailing spouse or any other you know, unforeseen event in your life, you know, then you are eligible to apply for, uh, for this administrative supplement. 
So note that down. And if you think you have had some issues like that during your K, uh, you, you talk to me and I will be able to help you out. And the next one is the administrative supplement to recognize excellent in DEIEA mentorship. So this is uh, something new. It came only last year. And uh, <clears throat> so the supplement award will provide up to $250,000 direct cost, not to exceed the cost of parent award to grant supporting faculty members who have mentoring and or mentorship as part of their existing awards and have demonstrated a commitment to outstanding mentorship and training, especially to individuals from groups identified as underrepresented in the biomedical sciences. So, so this is important, but one of the issue is that, you know, if you wrote your K award or R01 or, or R03 or R21, so in that, if you had included that you will have a mentoring portion in there for underrepresented minority. If you included that initially, it's a great news. You will be totally eligible to apply for that. And, and also if you currently have some of the underrepresented minorities uh, in the in the in your lab and you're taking care of them, you know. So again, you know, uh, talk to me and I will be able to help you out if you have any of those uh, 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 issues in, in, in the lab and you think you are eligible to apply for this. I will be happy to talk. It's, it's a lot of money actually, you know, and it's, it's a big help. Okay, the, the latest thing is again, uh, the data management and sharing plan. This is new and I think you all the K awardees and, and, and beyond R01, R21 awardees, you all will have to include uh, the data sharing plan in, 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 in your grant applications. And the data type is the types of and amounts of scientific data expected to be generated in the project scientific data that will be preserved and shared and rationale for doing so, metadata and other relevant data and associated documentation. So all these things are important. Please see the NIH web page for data sharing. This is the website here, sharing.nih.gov and, and look into that and see if your application has some of these data uh, involvement. So you will have to write additional page on that. So jumping guns to early stage investigator, uh, it, it's a big deal because uh, it applies only to R01. So those of you who are all clinical clinician scientists, you all you all are qualified because you all are within ten years of your uh, uh, last training. Uh, that is the fellowship or or your residency. So we count number of years from then. So the PDPI who is within 10 years of completing the terminal research degree or within 10 years of completing medical residency, you know, the extensions can be requested based on medical issues, extended period of clinical training, family care responsibilities, maternity leave, et cetera. So those of you, a woman and had a baby, you automatically qualify one additional year. So for the extension of your ESI status. So what are the benefits of your ESI when you're writing your R01? It's, so your application is reviewed in cluster for R01 applications and at the CSR Center for Scientific Review, and you are not reviewed with your peers or with your seniors, with your professors. You don't need much preliminary data as compared to your established uh, mentors and investigators. NIH is committed to support new investigator and early stage investigator at success rates equivalent to that established investigator submitting new application. So in, in, in a given study section, if uh, 10 applications were funded as new application by established investigators, so technically we are supposed to fund 10 early stage investigators to match uh, the number of established investigator. So in having said that, to submit a multiple PIR01 application for an ESI is a bad idea because you want to have total control of your first R01 as a PI and don't get into a multi-PI application. The another R01 is CATS R01, which is PAR-21-038. 
Uh, again, this is for early stage investigators, R01. But I feel, you know, like you're better off writing your individual R01 rather than CATS R01. Why would I say that? Because first you have to be an ESI. So, so it doesn't make a difference whether you're writing your first regular R01 or CATS R01. You have to be an early stage investigator. The second one is in CATS R01, you have to prove that you are going into a new direction to your research. So whatever you are trained in, you are not going to be doing that research, but you will be doing something else, some newer research. So in that case, the burden becomes, you know, and the reviewers determine whether you are really doing that or not. So, you know, again, you are dependent on the reviewers. And then again, you cannot include any unpublished preliminary data in your research plan. So it's important for you uh, uh, to, to, to use the published data. So whatever figures you are putting or tables you are putting in your preliminary data, make sure that you put in, refer uh, uh, in the figure legend or the table legend that, that this figure or this table came from such and such reference, very important. So, so that's the CATS R01. And so we have had some successes, but not a lot. So this is the R38 plan. This is for Harry Kugli and uh, Pradeep Ramalu. Uh, so what is this? Stimulating access to research in residency. Uh, so this is a newer program. So the first received date is uh, March 15, 2024, application date. So it supports institutional mentor training programs that propose to engage resident investigators in research. So, so the residents can take a year or two off during residency and involved in research. It will support for a minimum of two to and a maximum of four resident investigators each year. It provides outstanding and immersive mentor research opportunities for ophthalmology and optometrist resident investigators, including DVM ophthalmologists. Uh, it requires 80% effort for residents, so they can still do 20% of subclinical work if they want to do, but 80% is minimum effort required. Duration is one to two years, and this is the notice, and this is the first received date. So if you're planning on submitting, st you start working on it, and, and if you have any questions, I will be happy uh, to answer that. So this is institutional training grant for residents as compared to K-12, which is institutional for, for the full-fledged clinicians. Changing gears now, loan repayment program uh, is saying the purpose of LRP is to attract health professionals to a career in research. And what we do, we pay their educational debts. A number of you at Wilmer have been successful in getting loan repayment program. What are the qualifying loans? Educational loans backed by the US government and educational loans from accredited US academic institutions and commercial lenders such as Bank of America, et cetera. So what it does, uh, we pay up to $50,000 of debt payback and accrued IRS taxes in one year, 50,000 per year. One has to be a US citizen and US permanent resident and 50% time commitment. So since you are having your K grant, so you are already committed to 50 to 75 or more percent of time. So you automatically uh, qualify for LRP, number one. And number two, since you are involved in research, you have a full fledged uh, uh, research project. So you can submit the same thing for LRP. It's a small application online. So, so not, not, a, not difficult. It's renewable multiple times. Till you have finished your <clears throat> last thousand dollars of loan, we will be able to 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 keep paying you that. So you don't have to really pay. All you have to do is to keep writing. It's mentored, so you have mentored. NIH grant support not required. You don't have to have a K or R01, etc. You can apply without it. Online application is peer reviewed, and deadline is once a year, every year, November fifteen. So we participate in pediatric research, clinical research, health disparity research, REACH, and L34, which is diversity. So those of you who are underrepresented, minority, et cetera, they, can, uh, they are eligible to write L34. 
This is the data for last year, fiscal year 2022. So our funding rate was 87% and NIH funding rate was 59%. So we really uh, like to fund as much as we can. And we allocated 1.3 million uh, for the fiscal year 2022. And we allocated the same money for fiscal year 2023. The data hasn't come yet for fiscal year 2023. So that's why I haven't presented this here. And this is the, uh, the data for uh, uh, RO1 successes. So total LRP submitted uh, from 2012 to 2022, 399. Total LRP funded 297, 74%, so total. So the RO1 applies 54 and total RO1 awarded 23, so 42%. So average number of years for first RO1 is 1.6 years. So this is in the line of all my K awards, K08 and K23, which is almost the same percentage. I will stop here. Thank you. And I'm sorry I took a little bit long because I thought I will take the liberty of presenting you the whole thing. You know, uh, it's a good platform. And so, so, so I'm ready to have some questions if you have. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dr. Agarwal. That was fantastic. Uh, loads of really helpful information for everyone to consider. Um, uh, in the interest of time, I think we're going to have to move on. But Dr. Agarwal, there were a couple of questions in the chat from Dr. Romulo and Dr. Yohannan. Uh, uh -huh. So if you're able to answer those in the chat, that'd be great. Otherwise, uh, we may I have be able to answer those. Sure. On. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, so next, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Harry Quigley, who is the A. Edward Maumini Professor of Ophthalmology here at the Wilmer Eye Institute. Uh, many of you probably already know him or know of him. He's for many years run a very successful clinical and translational science laboratory research program and has the, my, to my understanding, the longest continually funded RO1 uh, at the National Eye Institute. In addition, he was the inaugural PI of the Wilmer K-12 program, which was the first K-12 program funded by the NEI. And so he's going to be giving us some background on uh, the program here. Thanks, Harry. Well, thanks very much, Tom. And I want to, of course, uh, acknowledge Jim Handa, who's now the co-PI for our K-12 program at Wilmer, which began back when it was called K-11. The first of those, to our knowledge, was in 1987. Uh, and it may have been Jonathan Javitt, who uh, is a, a still actively uh, pushing for clinician scientists, especially at Wilmer, and we'll probably hear about more about that later. This just happens to be the the uh, the five year refunding of the K twelve program at Wilmer. But uh, simply to give you an idea, we've had forty eight Wilmer K scholars uh, under K mentored programs. Thirty one of the thirty eight who completed training remain in academic research related or research intensive practice. So if you believe the articles Peter showed you that this is a dinosaur uh, kind of a behavior. These are people who are having successful careers. 24 or 69% of our graduates have achieved their first R-level funding or the equivalent of that. And actually, there's an article that uh, in 2013 said that that rate was 13% among all K uh, graduates from the NEI. So what Dr. Agarwal's just shown you is a dramatic improvement in our funding by K awardees. And our, our group is at least that good, if not better. Of those K awardees who completed training more than five years ago from our team, 42% of those who got an original R01 had achieved a second or renewal R01. So this is not just getting lucky for your first grant, this is a life process. We have had 11 of our 38 past scholars who are women, and now the numbers are 50% of the last group that we've had over the last five years. Uh, and because the K-12 program now mandates that you can be on the K-12 for three years, but must then transition to either a K-08 or a K-23, the transition rate becomes a very important thing. And during our most, most recent four years of funding, uh, all of those who are on our K-12 have moved to individual K-08 or K-23s in order to continue that award time. The values of this program, the K-12 program, over or in addition to the K-08, K-23, is that it provides an infrastructure within a department 
where other Ks can fit into an ongoing system. Uh, we have a department-based committee for the oversight of all of the Ks, whether they're individuals or under the K-12. But the K-12 allows us to plan ahead. So if someone is asking for a, a, an application to be a new faculty member in July, we could, with a K-12, and for those departments that are that have joined us here, Josh Danayev and Ivan O and uh, uh, others, they can say in December, okay, we know you're no, you're on a K because we have a slot in our K-12 for you. And that takes the worry out of being close as opposed to waiting until literally the month before uh, to find out that you've been awarded the K. I think it also therefore allows a lot of flexibility in planning faculty development for chairpersons. For our particular program, and we'll probably talk about this in the, in the discussion, uh, we ask that applicants actually write a full K proposal in order to be considered for our K-12. We think that shows a commitment on the part of uh, each person. It means that they're already uh, have a, a well-planned mentored training program. Each of those applications, our internal committee runs through a rigorous NAH style review. So we pretty much already know what a study section might say if it is and will be, and they all are submitted for a K08 or K23, even when they're uh, placed on the K12 here. Uh, we've had several applicants who in whom we didn't have enough spots for a K person, the two slots in our K12 uh, that are available at any given time were filled. And so those get their application reviewed and go straight to uh, successfully getting the K08 or K23. Wilmer now has seven K awardees on individual and K12 uh, positions. Of our faculty, we have 200 and some odd faculty at Wilmer, 90 of them are identified as potential primary or co-mentors for a K program, and 34 of our faculty have already served as a mentor. And I think that's that's something that larger departments need to work on if they don't uh, already have that as something that's an important part of their faculty culture. We have the collaborative possibilities through Johns Hopkins Medicine. And I would recommend that anyone who's writing a mentored training program have a team of mentors, not just one. One of those should be a clinician scientist, one potentially a basic scientist, and one of those two or another person should be a non-ophthalmic based scientist to add expertise in particular scientific areas to the kind of work that's going to go on in the mentored training. We typically <clears throat> let, uh, with the permission of a past awardee, each applicant see a K application because it's a daunting process to look at the NIH uh, form and say, oh my goodness, could I possibly fill this thing out? But if you see what one actually looks like, it's a lot easier to then say, oh, well, I understand what I should be doing. Uh, I assume we're gonna be talking about our rising assistant professorships, which are endowed positions for assistant professors at Wilmer. And I'll mention just now, before we get into the further things, that we do an annual review. The committee looks at every mentor mentorship team and make sure that the maximum opportunities are being taken advantage of, as well as looking for problems. And believe me, problems do come up and need to be uh, worked on. Uh, there are issues of science not going the way one originally thought. There are issues of ownership of process and uh, which, which work should I be doing? And to have a faculty committee that's uh, helping out is extremely useful. And maybe, Jim, Handa, if you have anything else that you'd like to add about the Wilmer program, I know I'm putting you on the spot. I'm not sure that you thought we were going to do this, but anything you want to add that I haven't mentioned? Uh, no, Harry, and in, in, in my talk, I'll cover one other aspect. So I think uh, what you did is a great summary. All right. Well, thanks very much, Tom, and we'll move on. Thanks so much, Harry, for sharing the details of the Wilmer program. I'm sure we'll have a lively discussion at the upcoming roundtable discussion later. Um, so next, we're going to switch gears a little bit. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Kelly Jibo and Carla McCarthy. Dr. Jibo is the Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology in the Division of Infectious Disease and the Director of the Johns Hopkins KL2 program. Um, and Carla is the Project Administrator for the program. And they're going to talk to us about the Hopkins KL2 program, which is another funding um, opportunity that's available for internal Hopkins scholars. And it was the program that I was in for about a year before I got my K23.
Good morning, everybody. My name is Kelly Jibo. I am a professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins University and director of the KL2 program. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person today, but appreciate the opportunity to come and speak about the KL2 program. And uh, I'm very grateful to Carla McCarthy, who has been willing to join you to answer any questions. I wanted to give a brief update about the program uh, and just talk a little bit about the background. The KL2 program is geared to develop future leaders in clinical and translational research. Scholars receive training in research design and methods, and they work collaboratively with colleagues in other disciplines. So this is a very interdisciplinary project. We have uh, scholars from a wide variety of fields and a wide variety of schools represented who collaborate together to develop interdisciplinary projects that are, have translational implications. We provide our individuals with rigorous didactic training, uh, mentorship in interdisciplinary and collaborative environment, and then plenty of career development opportunities. So they are developing their own careers as independent investigators. Currently, we have seven Johns Hopkins scholars and three uh, scholars from the University of Maryland. We have new scholars who began on uh, July 1st. And uh, the, the collaboration between Hopkins and Maryland is longstanding, where we have both didactic and research experiences for students at both schools. The KL2 program offers $110,000 of salary support, which requires 75% effort, or at least 75% effort. We have uh, tuition, which is up to $18,000, um, and we have travel allocation of just over $2,000 per scholar per year. In terms of the training programs uh, here at Hopkins, we have several that a number of the fellows participate in. The GTPCI program is one of the most uh, sought after, and many of our scholars pursue this in one of the different tracks that they have in the GTPCI program. General is very common, as well as the data analysis. There's also the experience of clinical trials, if people are interested in that. Some of our scholars in the past have done the uh, PhD program in cardiovascular and clinical epidemiology. Uh, there's also the possibility to add on a one-year biostatistics MHS if you pursue the PhD. And then some of our students who have previous experience pursue individualized programs. Uh, this can include uh, individual courses or keystone symposia. Uh, sometimes these are mini sabbaticals or laboratory experiences in different laboratories that allow our scholars to gain very important skills for their specific research project. These must be approved by the program leadership. There's a number of different programs at the University of Maryland. I won't go into all of these, but they include uh, the School of Pharmacy, the graduate school programs in the School of Medicine, and then they also have certificate programs, which several of the scholars at Maryland participate in. In terms of required programs, uh, all of our scholars fill out an individualized development program. They meet with KL2 faculty uh, at least twice a year formally and then uh, informally throughout the year. In terms of other uh, opportunities that we present to the scholars, they all have to write a uh, K-23 or another K career development award, uh, and they take a grant writing course as part of that. They participate in WAGs, which are um, writing accountability groups. These are in the summer, so they're actually meeting right now, approximately eight to ten uh, times over the, the course of the summer. They attend a monthly seminar series where we talk about a variety of topics in translational research, as well as career development um, activities. So this gives the scholars interactions with people both intrinsic to the program as well as outside of both universities in industry and government and in uh, NGOs who provide them some of the story about how they got to where they are. All of our scholars attend the annual translational sciences meeting, which is typically held in April. They meet with our biostatistician, Dr. Wang, who's terrific and helps them with thinking about their projects, both in terms of data collection and making sure that they're thinking about their data appropriately before they collect it, as well as when they analyze it. And then we have uh, opportunities to present um, at outside institutions as part of a visiting professor program that I'll talk about in just a second. In terms of our application process, we have scholars uh, that we recruit from all of the schools across the university. Each applicant is reviewed by, uh, on average, five faculty. Uh, and then we select scholars on a variety of different criteria, um, most notably, uh, what is their research plan and what are their potential career development activities. The application includes a nominating letter by the proposed faculty member and their department, uh, sorry, by the proposed faculty mentor and their department. Um, the proposed mentor also submits an NIH biosketch. There's two additional letters of recommendation. The scholar then also submits um, an essay about what the, why they want to study and what they propose to study. And then they submit a CV or biosketch. We have our applications, which are typically due in December. We select uh, candidates to be interviewed in January. 
We have our final selections in February and scholars are tending to, to be notified by the end of February. On average, uh, we've been receiving between 10 and 30 applications per year. Uh, you can see this is a, a, about how many we've done over the past 15 years. Uh, and on average, we have about a 30% acceptance rate. Um, so it's a very competitive program. This is uh, similar at the University of Maryland, where they have also a very competitive program. And then I just wanted to hit a, a brief activity that we have in terms of how Hopkins and Maryland interact with the national CTSAs. In this visiting professorship program, this was developed during COVID to give scholars the opportunity to present and be uh, grand round speakers, as well as to have a visit with faculty and scholars at various different programs in the CTSA. It's been a really significant uh, success, and it's actually continued despite being after COVID at this point. Here's a list of the uh, scholars that we have hosted here at Johns Hopkins from a variety of institutions. And then here are scholars that we have had who have gone on to other institutions. So you can see a wide variety of topics. It's been nice to see various different departments represented. It's also been terrific for us to have the opportunity to meet with scholars from a variety of different programs across the country. We agree to do uh, between two and three scholars per year from Johns Hopkins that we send out, and we will also receive two to three uh, at the Hopkins and Maryland program. Just to give a brief update on our scholar achievements, uh, as I mentioned, the, the goal of our program is to get independently funded investigators. So everybody writes a K uh, grant. Uh, some also submit career development awards to foundations or other places. These are some of our recent scholars who were recently funded. Uh, we're very proud of all of them. And we have a number who are also uh, currently resubmitting or who are currently under review. In terms of uh, our application, we resubmitted our K-12 application, which is the new program uh, that's going to be administered by NCATS. This was done in May. We hope to hear uh, some positive news this fall. We'll wait to see what happens. Um, and we're looking forward to the opportunity to continue this moving forward. I thank you for the opportunity to present. I really appreciate uh, your attention today, and I look forward to receiving any questions. Uh, Carla will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Carla, I, I see you on here. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I just have a couple of questions for you. I know Dr. Jibo mentioned um, the funding structure is going to change from a KL2 to a K12 program. Does that have any implications for um, future applicants or current scholars? Um, implications in, in what way? In so, the structure of the program, the activities. So the activities are so are going to change a little bit. So overall, everything is going to stay the same. So it's just, it's going to say, instead of being a KL2, it's going to be a K12. And CATS decided that that's what they wanted to do. They're doing something very similar with our TL1. Instead of being a TL1, it's now going to be a T32. Um, that's how they wanted to align the programs. Um, overall, the way that we submitted it, it's going to be pretty similar. So we added a few, uh, you know, new components. So Dr. Jibo mentioned the grant writing course. Um, we're making that available to everybody um, now and then moving forward. So they'll have access to that grant writing course, even if they're not doing the GTPCI program. Um, the seminars are going to be a little bit broader. So we are integrating our K and our T program a little bit more. Um, so they will have access to more seminar content than they did in the past. Um, but other than that, the, the requirements and the content will be pretty similar. It's just instead of saying KL2, it'll now be a K12. Got it. Thank you. Um, and then my other question was, you know, there were the K12, uh, the KL2 program had a lot of structured components. There were, you know, the writing accountability work groups and then the grant writing seminars, um, probably perhaps more structured contents than some of the K12 programs that we'll hear about later on. Um, just wanted to know how you guys evaluate the effectiveness of these structured components of the scholars and what are, have been things, other activities that you've tried in the past and what kind of works well for the scholars? So we are um, setting up, you know, surveys, ways that we're going to be, you know, kind of evaluating those. So one thing that I will say, so, you know, the current grant started in 2019. Our new grant will start in 2024. Um, how things were structured before I started. So I started in end of 2019. Um, there were some surveys. We have annual surveys that we're doing. We have um, alumni surveys that we're doing. Usually the grants, um, 
the writing accountability groups, we do just a general survey to see how the scholars really like it. They tend to really like it, so we continue it. Um, but we're going to start doing a little bit more kind of structured, you know, surveys, you know, those kinds of things um, moving forward to kind of analyze and see how the program is doing um, so that we can have that content as we move the, pro the program forward. So the program has changed quite a bit, I would say, in the last year um, with Dr. Jivo taking over. So we have a lot. So the structure was there before, which you were familiar with. Um, it's a lot more structured. And like I said, we're trying to integrate the T program into it. Um, so as we do that, we're starting to have, there's going to be a lot more, you know, checking to see exactly if, if this is the direction we want to continue and if, you know, the scholars are enjoying it and those kinds of things. So we'll be doing more of that. Great. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you very much. It's it's heartening to see uh, such a broad landscape of opportunities for young clinician scientists looking to get further training in the field. Um, I want to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jim Handa, who's the director of the retina division at the Wilmer Eye Institute and has also uh, run a very productive and successful uh, clinical and laboratory based research programs. He's also the former chair of an NEI study section, and so he has a very high-level understanding about grant writing and the review process, and he's going to be telling us a little bit about the Wilmer Grant Review Committee as a potential uh, uh, mechanism uh, or tool that may be useful to other uh, institutions. Uh, great. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Great. Um, sorry. After all these years of COVID, I uh, this format looks a little bit different from what I'm used to. Um, so, uh, Tom and and Cindy, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. I think this is a really informative uh, session this morning. I've been tasked with talking about the Wilmer uh, Grant Review uh, Committee, and so the realities of Wilmer's environment, as, as as Harry sort of alluded to, he's put together really a fantastic K twelve program that's been highly successful. Uh, we also have orchestrated a Wilmer K committee, which he alluded to, where we uh, uh, assess each mentee's research program and also critically assess each K mentor's involvement and submit a formal critique to both the mentee mentor and also to Peter McDonald so he can keep tabs on us. Um, the reality, on the other hand, we have a lot of experience uh, uh, faculty who are uh, interested in, in mentoring, but research time is stretched thin, as we all know, and faculty are not compensated for mentoring. Um, so um, we developed a grant review committee, which was developed really uh, as part of, I took a number of years ago, I took this wonderful course called the Master Mentor Course to learn how to be a better mentor. And at the year-long conclusion of this course, the, uh, we were, each person was tasked with developing a mentoring program in their respective departments. And I chose, since my passion is to keep the clinician scientist alive, was to develop a, a grant review committee to help improve the funding rates. So the goal obviously is to improve funding rates of grant proposals for um, younger faculty members. And I think the key uh, things that I thought about was to evaluate the research idea before the grant is written. I'll get into that. Uh, to provide some meaningful grant writing direction beyond what the mentor provides as an outside critique, and to provide objective critique of the grant proposal itself on which improvements can be made before the proposal is submitted to the funding agency. And we've encouraged all assistant professors, and we've had um, associate and full professors participate in what as well. So um, I think what's really helpful in thinking about this committee and when you're writing grants is is really uh, to think about what makes a grant fundable and really the buzzword is always impact. And so what is impact? And the way I think about it is in three, three sort of parts. By addressing the hypothesis, will the proposed research change how people think about the chosen topic? That's impact. Secondly, do the proposed aims interrogate the hypothesis? So any tangential experiments which don't directly uh, attack the hypothesis won't address the hypothesis, thus the impact gets reduced. And lastly, is the scope of work appropriate? Uh, if you propose too little research, it's going to fail to fully integrate the hypothesis. If you propose too much research, you won't get around to completing all of the experiments, and so you're going to not achieve uh, the aims of what you need to do and the 
uh, impact is going to be reduced. This is also a buzz term that we oftentimes see on grant reviews of the overambitious grant, which is frequently a grant killer. So our grant review committee, how does it work? Um, what happens is the mentee or the grant writer will identify a research idea, rationale for the project and a hypothesis and comes to me, will identify three experts uh, to serve on the committee and review the grant. Now, what this means for the committee members is really a three to four hour obligation over six months. So we have an initial one hour meeting and then toward the grant deadline, there's a two to three hour critique of the grant uh, proposal where they uh, review it NIH style. So at the initial one hour meeting with uh, where the, uh, the grant applicant will present to the committee members and the mentor, there's it's about a 10, uh, 15 to 20 minute pre presentation of the research idea, presenting the underlying rationale, the hypothesis, the aims, uh, what they think are significant or innovative and a brief outline of the approach. And then the remaining uh, discussion focuses on really determining impact. So uh, what the bottom line is, does the committee think uh, the idea is, uh, is a fundable idea? Um, and uh, discussion also will uh, sort of pivot to optimizing the research idea, suggesting research directions, focusing on the, the central idea, and uh, a, a discussion on uh, suggesting uh, needed uh, pilot data. Um, the whole idea is we want to make sure that the idea is worth uh, an applicant spending four or six months writing. Uh, if they don't have a fundable idea, um, it's not worth spending the time. Um, so after that committee meeting, then we the mentee starts writing the grant. We suggest that they uh, solidify the specific aims page um, since many grants are sort of decided after uh, reviewers read the specific aims page and then um, move on to the approach uh, and then uh, finish up with the other su uh, suggestions. I offer the opportunity to critique each section along the way um, with really providing understandable writing, making sure the writing is clear so that um, one can understand what you're trying to accomplish in the grant. And as some advice that was given to me a number of years ago, you write a grant to the least smart reviewer to make sure that everybody can understand. I like to provide some grantsmanship tips that I learned sitting on study section uh, and from my own experience writing grants. Um, and also to keep people on task, I think it's very important that make uh, make one make sure that the aims address the hypothesis, and I think that's important to keep going back over to make sure that you're staying focused and on task, and also to make sure that the proposed work is uh, the scope is appropriate. I also suggest that uh, the applicant write one aim at a time so that we can critique it before they move on to make sure that the old structure and the approach is on target. So we, we asked that um, the applicants um, finish writing the grant one or two months before the deadline so that the reviewers or the committee members can then review the grant NIH style. We ask that they return the grant within one week. Um, and it's uh, all of the elements that you see on a formal NIH review uh, to make comments. Now, if the if the grant writer is not meeting the deadline, then a full review may not be uh, may, may not be feasible, just the realities of life. Um, the mentee and the mentor receive the critiques, and um, that hopefully will provide some valuable critiques to make changes before submitting the grant. So lessons learned from this whole process, I think the biggest emphasis is start writing the grant early. We recommend a six-month period. Um, this is particularly important for clinician scientists because um, I don't know about you, but um, I always seem to have more emergencies or other obligations when I'm grant writing, or at least it feels that way. So you want to make sure you have enough time to, uh, to overcome these barriers that come along the way as you're writing the grant. And really use of the committee is, uh, is dependent on how early the mentee initiates the committee's help. Um, the uh, the the if you start early, you can also sort of figure out um, what pilot data that you need to do. And my observations, needing to get appropriate pilot data delays the grant construction or the submission. And we oftentimes find that 
pilot data the you know is really needed uh, to support the conceptual feasibility of a grant or uh, to show technical feasibility. And sometimes these ideas come up after the aims and the approach have been uh, initiated, just greater insight uh, emerges after one really thinks about the problem. Um, and we also suggest that you work closely with the mentor to set up deadlines to make that uh, to make sure you stay on task and that each of the sections get completed in a timely fashion. Um, so really, I think really taking advantage of all these experienced researchers is really helpful. Uh, it's interesting. We have uh, at Wilmer, I went back and looked at all the, the people who went through the committee and 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 really over eight years, only five uh, K mentees have gone through the entire process where they've gotten the reviews. It's a hundred percent success rate. Uh, there's a bit there is a bit of a fall off for those who don't go through the entire process and 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 take advantage of what the expertise of the committee members have. So I, I really encourage people to go through the whole thing. It really can work. And I, I wish uh, everybody good luck in their uh, in, in their endeavors. Thank you so much, Jim. I know we really appreciate all your effort in organizing the Garrett Reiner Committee. I certainly know I've benefited from it. Um, next, we have Dr. Akrit Sodi, who is the Brana and Irving System Line Associate Professor of Ophthalmology in the Retina Division. He's a very successful clinician scientist who went through the NEI K08 program and is now independently funded. He'll discuss the transition from um, K grants to R grants. Sorry about that. I just had to unmute and then call put it back on. Thank you so much for, for organizing this and for giving me the opportunity to participate. I was given the um, the topic of K to R transition, which is a little bit more nebulous than I think the other topics. Uh, so I set out to sort of put together five steps um, that would guarantee you transition from a K award to an R award. Um, and then, you know, thinking about it, everyone sort of starts off at a different place. You know, some people are doing clinical research, some people are doing basic science, there are MD, PhDs, there are people who have no research experience. And I thought, well, it's sort of silly to try to come up with five steps that would lead to a K to R transition. Um, however, I did come up with six steps, and that seemed much more reasonable. So I'll go ahead and share those with you. Um, so one of the questions that's often asked um, from K awardees is when should we start thinking about the K award to R transition? When should we start writing the, the R award? And the, the answer, quite honestly, is earlier, earlier than you think, earlier than you did. Um, fortunately, the, the way that the K award is designed, you've already started the process, even though you may not be entirely aware. Um, when you write a good K award, your mentors you know, ultimately may end up being your co-investigators or co-PI, your uh, education plan ends up being your um, areas of expertise. Your research plan um, doesn't necessarily um, have to flow into what you do in your R award, but it does provide the foundation uh, and the um, research expertise that you'll need in order to transition from the uh, K award to the R award. So I encourage all K awardees to start talking about the R award with their mentors when they're writing their grant. Is this a grant that will teach me what I need to do in order to get an R award? Are we thinking about things like impact, like um, novelty? Are we thinking about feasibility? Are we thinking about the key things that are looked at when someone uh, who doesn't have a, an R award applies for the first R award? Uh, and it's important that your mentor, in addition to helping you with your science, uh, is also considering that transition from the very beginning. And it's important that you bring it up to them so that they um, they also keep that in the back of their mind. So step two um, is focalize. So I don't know if any of you have heard of um, Jean-Marc Servija. Show, show of hands. Um, so... Now, which makes sense. He was a postdoc in my lab. He's not particularly famous, but he always used to use the word focalize uh, whenever he would talk to us about research. Um, and at the time, I thought he made the word up. He was from, ironically, Barcelona, um, which he was talking about earlier in the um, meeting. Um, and you know, a lot of what he was saying, um, a lot of the words he used, he made up. So I thought this was one of them. But this is a real word, focalize, and it's to focus. And I, I do think it's something that a lot of 
new researchers um, have some difficulty doing. There's a lot of things you discover early. There's a lot of avenues to pursue. And um, I think it's sometimes hard to set aside some of those paths to focus on one, potentially two, that will be your main effort. And I, I do think that's critical. It's critical, critical for you to have the discipline to do that. And it's critical for your mentor to make sure you have the discipline to do that. Um, when I was doing my graduate work at the NIH, the, um, the director of the NIH was Harold Varmus, and he used to give a talk to graduate students. It was the same one he would give every year, and I would attend every year, and he would talk about the steps where people, postdocs, learn to become better scientists, and he, you know, some of the earlier steps I'll skip, but he, you get to the point where you have ideas um, that a year later, six months later, end up in nature cell, and you say to yourself, okay, I've I've got it. I, I have nature and cell ideas, you know, our New England Journal, if you do clinical research, I'm, I figured it out. I'm going to be a good scientist. And his point was that that's not, that doesn't predict you're going to be a good scientist. Um, everyone has nature cell ideas. Some of you have had them, you know, during the course of the two hours of this meeting. The key isn't coming up with a nature cell idea. The key is knowing which of those ideas you have the expertise to pursue. And that's the one you should pursue while the others you should set aside. That's challenging. A lot of people have difficulty making that distinction. And that's something your mentor needs to help you with while you're trying to uh, focus on one particular avenue to pursue. So step three, uh, channel your inner MacGyver. So some of you may, may not really understand what that means. And before I explain, I just like to explain what it doesn't mean. If this is the face of MacGyver that pops into your head, this pretty boy, this is not MacGyver. So just ignore that. It's Richard Dean Anderson, the original MacGyver. So when I say channel your inner MacGyver, during your K award, you, you have this unique opportunity to build all sorts of tools, tools that you can then use when you do your R award or you apply for your R award. Um, you should be taking advantage of that opportunity, whether it's expertise um, in terms of statistics or it's novel animal models or it's um, you know, unique you know, organoids. Um, or stem cell research, you need to develop expertise that will lead to things like impact and innovation that you can then put into your R grant. And you should always be thinking about, you know, how is this approach, how can I make it unique or make it better so that when I eventually do transition to a, an R award, it'll have that impact. It'll be looked at as being innovative. Uh, you don't have many opportunities while you're on an R award to come up with very novel um, models or approaches, uh, your K award does lend itself to that. So I would um, encourage you to be thinking of building a big tool set. And it's important if you focus on one topic um, to build tools that allow you to study that one topic. Um, so the next step, step four, uh, and Jim sort of uh, alluded to this is read, write, revise, and repeat. Your first idea, if you you write a, a, a specific aims page, or at least your initial hypothesis, and you spend a great deal of time polishing it. You spend like a few you know, weeks or months before you give it to someone. Um, you are gonna be very reluctant to listen to their feedback. You have to be willing to recognize that your first draft and your final draft are gonna be totally different. Your hypothesis might be similar, but you, you should be open to revisions. And that will mean reading a lot, which is, I think, critical um, when you start thinking about applying for an R award, what's new, what's known, what's not known, what's been published before, um, and what, what are the unanswered questions? And those can help you throughout your K award in guiding you towards a good project. So read all the time, write ideas, and revise them and keep repeating that. And along the way, seek critical feedback. Uh, and I know some of you see this is step 4B and I kind of cheated. I said there's gonna be six steps, but that's, you're gonna have to live with that. Um, you can use Jim's um, committee as one opportunity, but you want criticism. If you get, uh, you know, if you write your K award or your, excuse me, your R award specific aims page and you hand it to someone, your mentor or a colleague, and they tell you it's awesome, you know, you are wonderful. It'll make you feel good. It'll make you more confident. It has a lot of positive impact on you. It does 
absolutely nothing for your, um, your R application. You want to improve your application, you need someone to be critical. So be open to criticism and seek criticism. You don't have to listen to the criticism, but at least hear it out and try to understand why you know, that criticism exists and what you can do to improve it. Step five, publish or perish. And um, this is sort of the research equivalent, especially for a new investigator as um, sort of for real estate, uh, the concept of location, location, location. Uh, for a new investigator, it's feasibility, feasibility, feasibility. Um, you can say you're going to do something all you want. You can even show preliminary data that suggest you can do something. But if you publish a paper, and it doesn't have to be a cell paper or a New England Journal paper, but if you can publish a paper showing that you've done it before, that you have the expertise, that the model, the novel model you have, you've characterized, whatever it might be, if you've published it, that, that reassures the reviewers that you're capable of doing what you're suggesting. The, the biggest hurdle that new investigators have is proving to the study section that they can do what they're suggesting they will do. A lot of people have very good ideas, very good grant applications. They're well-written, um, but it gets um, poor, poorly scored in part because the committee isn't sure that they can actually do what they, they say they're gonna do. And this is a reasonably skeptical group of individuals that are reviewing your grant. So if you can publish a paper or two demonstrating feasibility, that goes a long way. My final um, piece of advice to everyone, and I always tell this to people whenever I give advice, which is not um, frequently, is you do you. Um, people's advice for you is motivated by two things. It's motivated by things that make themselves feel better about their own decisions. Like I might say, do basic science research, become an academic researcher, because that's the decision I made. Um, and sometimes it's motivated by things where it didn't work out, you know, try not to do too much clinic because it'll take your focus away um, from your research or, you know, try not to do clinical and basic science at the same time, whatever it might be. The truth is my failures don't predict your failure. Um, so if I wasn't able to do something, that doesn't necessarily mean you won't be able to do something. So take the advice, listen to people, um, but you do you, you decide whether or not you want to pursue, you know, what it is you had in mind. And if I tell you that just won't work, uh, and you think, you know what, awkward's wrong, I think it will, you go for it. And better yet, tell me, you know, what I did to fail and then do it differently. Um, you should look at your mentors, not as people who can write a plan for you or a set of steps uh, that can allow you to be, you know, Dr. X 2.0, uh, you want someone who can guide you to be the best uh, researcher that you can be, which ideally and most likely will be better than your mentor. And that should be your goal. Um, my case, it wasn't, but that, that's a different story. But um, I, I think that you, you really ought to try to do your best to follow what you think is best for you. So that's the end of, and those of you who haven't seen Napoleon Dynamite, you should watch the movie as well. Uh, that's my um, two cents. Uh, feel free to ignore. Thank you very much, Acker. That was uh, very wise advice uh, and very entertaining. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to the final uh, straightforward presentation before we start going into roundtable discussions and uh, hopefully open it up to a little bit more participation from uh, the audience. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Jonathan Javitt, uh, who was a former uh, Wilmer resident and actually one of the first recipients of a K08, or at that time, K11 award from the National Institute. He's now the founder, director, and chief scientist of NRX Pharmaceuticals. And uh, we asked Jonathan to join this panel to say a few words about approaches that ophthalmology departments can consider to help junior faculty and young clinician scientists secure additional funding opportunities. Uh, as we know, uh, clinician scientists at early stages of their career are working really hard at a particularly vulnerable point where they have a lot of clinical demands, uh, they need funding uh, in order to protect their time and conduct their research, 
But uh, K awards ultimately uh, don't provide that much extra funding for the research itself. And uh, without preliminary data or a track record in research, it can be challenging to secure the R grants that Akhara was telling us about. So Dr. Javid is going to tell us uh, about one uh, opportunity that he's been instrumental in founding here at Wilmer, something called the Rising Professorship Program. Oh, you're uh, muted, Jonathan. Okay, am I now sufficiently unmuted? Yes, sir. And we got slides up. Uh, nope, we just see it. There we go. Good. So for, for those of you who are sort of scratching your heads, you know, wondering why, uh, why I might have something to say to people who are interested in an academic career and a K award. Yeah, as, as Tom said, kindly, uh, I, I was actually the, uh, the first person to, to bring a K award to the Wilmer Institute. Uh, and actually the, the first ophthalmologist to be awarded a, a K award by uh, the National Eye Institute. And that's because of the extraordinary mentorship that I had really starting as a medical student uh, from uh, Al Somer and Harry Quigley. So the K award was written, uh, the, the only thing Tom that you said uh, more charitably than, than you might've wished is you accused me of having been a, a Wilmer resident uh, and uh, I, I can't claim that particular distinction. I, I was a Wills resident, but I was a, a medical student uh, briefly under Al Somer. That's how I came to do the work with Dr. Venkataswamy on uh, costs of saving sight in India. And you know that led to the, the lifelong relationship where we wrote the K Award together uh, when I was still a Wills resident. So I got to Wilmer uh, with the K Award in hand. And uh, you, you never know what you're really going to wind up working on when you write this award. But Al ran into an old CDC buddy of his on an airplane, a guy named Marshall McBean, who had just gotten to Medicare in order to try to do epidemiology research on the Medicare billing database. Uh, nobody had yet invented the word big data, but within uh, Three years, the National Eye Institute said, well, this is exciting stuff. So why don't you turn the K into an R01 early? So the K became an R01 after three years. Uh, and by the time we were through five years, uh, United Healthcare came along and said, well, big data is going to be the next thing in healthcare. Uh, and I wound up as the first national medical director of Optum Insight. Uh, back then it was called Ingenix, swearing that I was going to get back to clinical ophthalmology within five years. I said at the time, I'm, I'm not going to do this for more than five years. I want to get back to, to Wilmer. Uh, and I was on track to do that, uh, except for 9-11-2001, uh, which you know, was a disruptor in my life by 9-12-2001. Uh, uh, I was part of the Bush administration focusing exclusively on biodefense uh, and national security. Uh, and that led to a, a gig with the Bush administration to stand up the office of the National Coordinator for, for Health IT. And I never quite did get back to Wilmer full time, uh, although uh, you know, that ship hopefully hasn't sailed yet. But uh, you know, in the process, uh, you know, I've always thought a lot about Wilmer's past, which is why we have the old domes in the foreground, uh, and Wilmer's future. Uh, and if you take a look at the people who have been professors and chairman of ophthalmology across the United States, uh, more than half of them uh, trained at the Wilmer Institute. And that began with a day where, uh, you know, somebody would call Dr. Mominy and say, well, we're we're splitting our uh, IENT uh, department in half. We're hiring our first professor of ophthalmology. Who should it be? Uh, and Dr. Mominy appointed the first generation of chairman of ophthalmology. There wasn't much of a search committee. 
but you know those days are are different and uh, you know the question that uh peter and i started noodling around was how do we maintain an environment where you know the wilmer institute continues to be the the breeding ground the incubator for the academic leaders of ophthalmology uh through the next century and when I presented the, uh, the rising professor concept to, to the Wilmer board, uh, I talked to them about the, the parable uh, that's uh, you know, quoted in, uh, in the Jewish Talmud of a, a first century rabbi named Honi, who comes across an elderly woman uh, planting a, a carob tree. And carob trees are known not to give fruit for 70 years. And Honi says, well, how, how can you possibly benefit from the fruit of this tree? Uh, you're not a young person and this tree is not gonna give fruit for 70 years. And uh, the answer she gives is, uh, I'm planting this tree for my grandchildren. You know, just as our grandparents planted for us, we, we really have to plant for those who are gonna follow. Uh, and that's the whole idea behind the, the Wilmer Rising Professorship Program. Uh, and it's built around that sim simple proposition that you know, more leaders and chairpersons in ophthalmology have trained at Wilmer than uh, any other institution. And part of that is uh, because of a luxury that you know, I once benefited from, that if you spent you know, two days in the clinic and you didn't, uh, you, you didn't wanna earn a million dollars a year, you were very happy with an academic salary, uh, those two days in the clinic would pay for three days in the lab. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, that's no longer true. Uh, and similarly, if you wrote a good R01 uh, yeah, at the, during your fellowship, you had a decent chance of getting it funded on the first or second round. But now the average age at first R01 is, is 45 years old. So maintaining that global leadership and giving the kind of people who are able to, uh, to earn uh, faculty slots at the Wilmer Institute, the ability to uh, turn themselves into global leader uh, really needs some thought, some structure and some resources. Uh, and that was the idea behind establishing this, this rising professorship program. Uh, and the essence of the program is to provide resources, mentorship, but also structured education to uh, incubate, nurture, and empower the next generation of leaders in ophthalmology. Uh, and that's, you know, consists really of three things. One is the financial support that's needed to supplement a, a K award, because the, the K award these days you know, pretty much provides uh, enough salary support to, uh, you know, to buy back a, a day, maybe a little more than a day a week of, of clinic time, but there's still a gap. Uh, the, the structured mentorship to ensure that the critical first seven years is productive and goal-oriented. Uh, you know, it feels like, uh, you know, when you, you finally get out of fellowship, you, you get your, you know, your first year of faculty, you know, it feels like those seven years uh, to get promoted is a long time, and there's lots of time to, to, you know, to find your way. And the reality is those seven years go uh, at lightning speed. And uh, at the end of those seven years, you, you've either got the, the credentials to get promoted or uh, you, you're kind of behind the power curve. Uh, so the mentorship to ensure that, you know, every day of those seven years gets used uh, in the best possible ways is critical. Uh, and then the third is to build a structured education program uh, and leadership and management. And that's something we're still working on, but there's an active conversation with the Cary School of Business uh, in developing a program that, you know, won't necessarily be tailored to uh, empowering ophthalmology rising faculty to you know, become investment bankers at J.P. Morgan, but rather will empower ophthalmology rising faculty 
to be somebody that uh, a, a search committee would say that person is going to be able to build our department of ophthalmology. That person not only has the clinical skills uh, and the academic skills, but has the management skills to lead. So the idea was to uh, target people who are in their you know, first or second year post fellowship people who have already demonstrated an ability to succeed in the research world and having earned a K award is really a critical gating step because uh, the K award study sections are probably more charitably disposed to recognizing the, the potential of an applicant than any other study section within NIH. Within NIH. So, convincing a K award uh, study section that you've got the potential to, to be one of those future successful R01 grantees uh, is a uh, you know, clear ability to demonstrate that ability. Uh, people who have a demonstrated commitment to advanced education. So one of the qualifications for uh, rising professors is people who have you know earned a, an MPH, a PhD, who've who've demonstrated that you know that MD degree is not the end of their educational path. Uh, and then people who've demonstrated exceptional academic productivity. You know, the people who published their first peer-reviewed paper as uh, you know, a medical student or first year resident or you know, probably uh, you know, more likely to be future leaders. Uh, than people who do it much later. And you know, that, that's sort of the program in a nutshell. Uh, the fact that this uh, the fact that this symposium is being organized by the first person uh, in the Institute Tom to, to be recognized as a rising professor uh, and the things that Tom's already done with the rising professor resources, uh, you know, afforded to him uh, says a, a lot about the notion that uh, we might be on track. And hopefully this is a concept and a, and a program uh, that's going to go broader than Wilmer. I see that there are other chairman of ophthalmology uh, you know, joining us this morning. We've already had conversations with chairman of uh, other departments uh, within Johns Hopkins, who are interested in implementing this concept uh, within their department. Uh, and to the extent that there's anybody who's uh, joining us today who thinks I could be helpful in you know, offering some thoughts about you know, where they might take their early research or you know, how they might best position themselves to, uh, to be somebody who winds up as a rising professor, uh, you know, all of my contact information is on my JH, and uh, I'm easy to find. Uh, right now, I'm living in uh, in between on an island in between Miami and Miami Beach, and happy to spend time with any of you. So, thank you so much for uh, inviting me this morning and uh, for opening the dialogue. And Harry, thank you for being one of the mentors who uh, helped me write that first K award. Thanks so much, Jonathan. I know the rising professorship has been beneficial for so many of us on this call today. Um, so next up, I'm going to start sharing my screen. I have the pleasure of introducing a very exciting session, um, a roundtable discussion, hopefully more debate, of um, program directors from uh, NEI K-12 programs from around the country. We're joined by Dr. Ivano from UCSF, Dr. our very own Dr. Harry Quigley, Dr. Weinrev from the Shalilai Institute, Dr. Dana from Mass Ioneer, Dr. Denaya from UPenn, and Dr. Zaks. Thank you guys all so much for um, sharing your Saturday morning with us. I know some of you have to leave a little bit early and that's that's okay. All right, wanted to start off and kick off the session um, by just opening it up to, to the panel. We heard a lot about the Wilmer, the structure of the Wilmer K-12 program. I'd love to go around to the different panelists and have all of you all um, talk about the structure at, of the K-12 program at your own institution. Um, kind of what structure there is or um, how applicants are selected and what structured um, components there are to it. 
Well, I'd like to thank the folks at Wilmer for setting this up. A lot of really valuable information for trainees and program directors here. Uh, at UPenn, the program is structured really very similarly to what you outlined at Hopkins. Uh, we have uh, both patient-oriented research and basic research. We have a KL2 program uh, that can complement the, uh, the K-12. Uh, people can get a master's in public health. Uh, we have a committee that evaluates applicants and gives feedback on a regular basis. Uh, so yeah, very, very similar. Good morning, I can go next, uh, Reza Dana here. Um, thank you so much to all the uh, friends at Johns Hopkins for this program. Um, I was at Hopkins for many years, so it's a way of connecting with my uh, prior home institution. Um, I've been in Boston for a long time, and I'll tell you a little bit about the K program at uh, Harvard. We began the K-12 program in 2004. Uh, we've had 16 scholars that have gone through the uh, program. Uh, we've had funding uh, continuously since then, thankfully. Um, scholars have been in cornea, in retina, in neuro-ophthalmology and neuroscience, uh, glaucoma, and um, vision rehab. Um, of the 16 uh, scholars who have completed the program or the current to two who remain in the program now ongoing. Um, all of them except one who went to industry have had um, independent federal funding. Uh, two of the um, recent graduates have K08 funding. The other uh, 13 have had R01 funding and continue to have R01 funding. So we've been very, very successful um, in getting funding. Uh, looking at the Harvard ophthalmology program, we've had 30 K awards. So um, we've had K08s, we've had K23s, and then, as I mentioned, 16 have been K12s. Um, scholars come to Boston and they can utilize um, any of the resources within the Harvard and MIT ecosystem. Uh, the application includes a curriculum vitae, a letter of intent, and then a detailed scientific proposal, um, about two and a half, three pages, pretty much the similar structure as all the other grants, background, gaps in knowledge, hypothesis, uh, and aims. Along with recommendation letters, uh, we uh, typically get about four to six uh, full applications per year. Um, we select usually two to three. Um, as finalists, we invite them to Boston. They, come and interview with um, our uh, program advisory committee, a core group of faculty, senior faculty um, at Harvard, um, across the Harvard institu institutions, not only at Mass Ioneer. And then uh, we select one person and we notify them uh, by January of the year when they begin in, in July. Um, everyone is required to complete a program um, at Harvard. Um, it's a seven week immersion a program in biostatistics, epidemiology, and data analysis. Um, and that's from early July through uh, the uh, penultimate week in August. And then the faculty begin their full-time engagement in their new roles as faculty in September. Um, so that seems to work really well. Um, anyone who's interested can go and just Google Harvard K-12 or Harvard Ophthalmology K-12 and um, get more information. Thank you. Fantastic. Dr. Weinreib, did you want to tell us a little bit about your program? Great. Uh, well, thanks, Tom, for organizing the program. And, uh, and thanks for those excellent presentations. Jonathan, great, great to see you and hear from you. Uh, and good to see Harry Quigley, of course. Uh, so our program is a uh, one of the uh, newer programs. Uh, we're in our second cycle. We've had uh, six uh, K-12 awardees. Uh, we're thriving. 
Uh, all of them have uh, went from K-12. The first four have gone from uh, K-12 to uh, K awards, K-08. Um, our first awardee, Eric Noodleman, uh, now has independent funding. And our, our next uh, person up has uh, submitted uh, for independent funding. We have two current uh, K-12 awardees, Chris Toomey, who may or may not be on the call, uh, and Nathan Scott. And Chris uh, cycled through Wilmer and, and we're very grateful for the outstanding mentorship he got there from uh, Jim Honda and the rest of the uh, retina team. And then Nathan Scott uh, came to us via uh, Baskin Palmer and Bill Harbour. He's in ocular oncology and Chris is in retina. And our program is very similar to you know, what we've heard from uh, about the Wilmer program, very similar to the Harvard program. Uh, we do have a, a small twist. We have a, uh, a program, uh, a leadership program in academic medicine that the, the uh, K-12 people participate in. Uh, it's a development program with a very strong mentoring component for junior faculty um, at UCSD and it helps them develop the skills appropriate for their academic career, uh, implementing a personal strategic plan and expanding the network of colleagues within the health sciences and the university. There's a series of 16 workshops with topics ranging uh, from expectations for promotion to skill development and teaching and research to professional development and leadership training. And then during the second half of the program, they're choosing a professional development project and they're matched with a senior faculty mentor who's outside of the department who can facilitate uh, their progress in return for the time dedicated to the program. Uh, we support that. It's, it's been you know, highly uh, reviewed by our K-12 people. They really look forward to the program. They allot time each week for participating in it. Uh, we, we get several applications. We usually, <clears throat> like uh, we heard from Razor, we focus on maybe two or three, and then we typically offer you know, one position. And we're looking for people who can really bridge uh, the gap between what's happening in our department and what's happening in the institution. Uh, we have a very strong scientific institution as the other K-12 programs do, and we've been looking to build bridges. So when we bring somebody in, they already have a primary mentor from outside of the department. Uh, in the case of Chris Toomey, uh, he's mentoring with Jeff Esco, who's a glycobiology uh, person. He's a world leader in glycobiology, and Chris is interested in uh, dry AMD. And that has been a great partnership. Uh, Chris, uh, within just a few months of uh, starting the program, submitted his K08. Nathan Scott is, uh, is an ocular oncologist, and he's partnered with the uh, chair of pharmacology, Silvio Gutkin, who is a world leader in melanoma. And Nathan has a strong interest in choroidal melanoma. And, and they work in their laboratories, and they have office space in the laboratories, and uh, and we limit them to half a day of clinic, and we support uh, we support their uh, salaries um, throughout the whole process. Um, we we have strengths in a number of areas. We have, we're particularly looking for people who could build strengths in data science and bioinformatics, uh, bioengineering, neurosciences, and cell cell based and gene therapy. Um, great to see this wonderful turnout this morning. And again, congratulations, Tom, to you and the Wilmer team for putting together this, this wonderful program. Thank you very much. I, you know, I think it's great to hear some of these uh, unique twists on some of the programs. I think there are excellent ideas here that may be of interest uh, to programs across the country. Uh, Dr. Zaks, did you want to tell us a little bit about your program? Yeah, hi. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Now, thank you very much for including us in this program. It's a real pressure, pleasure to be here, and uh, I've enjoyed um, hearing the um, lectures so far. 
The uh, University of Michigan K-12 program is uh, now in its uh, 11th, 12th year. Um, we have been very successful in, um, in converting K-12 awardees into their own individual K grants, and then ultimately those who become eligible to then uh, proceed to their own uh, independent funding beyond that, uh, they've done very well. Um, the uh, program is probably rather similar uh, to, to most of the other programs out there in the sense that, you know, we're trying to identify uh, rising stars and people who um, really want to do something interesting, exciting, and innovative. Um, this, uh, but we don't view them just as um, uh, transitory. We typically, these are people we want in our faculty that we want to uh, have with us uh, for their career. Uh, and uh, in that regard, uh, we've been very successful. It's It helps um, uh, uh, advance the career. Um, I think that we have a structure that's similar to what, what has been described uh, elsewhere. Uh, lots of mentorship, lots of uh, um, interdepartmental um, collaborations, and really uh, setting up a team to set the candidate up for success. That's all, you know, nobody wants uh, failure. Everybody, that's, that wastes everybody's time. We want uh, to identify stars um, and, and nurture them appropriate feedback, you know, working with them on the, and um, it's, these are resources within the department and also, you know, Michigan's a, a huge university. They've got lots of resources here. We have an R01 boot camp. We've got et cetera, et cetera, all these kind of resources that really help you um, uh, uh, progress and, and, and those resources continue throughout one's career. Um, uh, funding is always going to be challenging and tough, but, you know, with these kind of teamwork efforts, um, it increases the probability greatly that uh, people can transition into independent funding, uh, and uh, that's the spirit in which we view it really as, as collaborative um, and, you know, making everybody um, successful. Um, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And Dr. O, did you want to tell us a little bit about your program? Yeah, thanks, Tom and Cindy, for organizing this. It's been really, um, as you said at the outset, I think a wonderful opportunity to share ideas and best practices. And our program is probably the youngest in the group. We just started in May 2020. Um, thus far, we've uh, appointed six scholars, of which the five who are eligible have now transitioned to their individual Ks. And um, as has been um, mentioned by the previous speakers, the structure and the identification of scholars is somewhat similar. We also um, recruit both internal and external candidates. I think among the scholars that we've had, one thing that has been unique is we've had um, among our recent scholars, some who have been making career transitions. So those who have already been on faculty for some time and have wanted to switch more to the clinician scientist pathway and protect their time to develop that part of their career. Um, has been a, a recent um, um, outcome. Um, one thing that also we do is we do have quarterly meetings where it's not just a work in progress meeting or check-in, but really a chance for us to address career development questions. We've talked about things such as how to set up a lab, how to take advantage of resources when you're first starting out, how to hire and identify good people. Um, we've talked about how to set up um, uh, best practices for setting up collaborations. Um, we've obviously talked about um, preparing individual K applications and um, uh, other grant uh, opportunities. We're going to be doing a grant editing workshop upcoming in August. Um, and I think, you know, just as has mentioned by previous speakers, you know, the, the university has plentiful resources. We also have a KL2 program. So we try to tailor make um, or, or receive the feedback from the group about what would be most useful to them. And so I think that um, is advantageous when you are a smaller department within a larger university, you can really identify what are the missing areas of career development um, and uh, clinician scientist pathway development. One of my other roles in the department is overseeing fellows. And so um, we have an early career development program um, that both residents and fellows attend. And um, that's another way for us to advertise the program and to talk about the clinician scientist pathway and the K-12 program um, in that context. 
So I think I've highlighted some of the um, differences or, or additional um, aspects of our program, but otherwise um, this has been really wonderful to learn about all the other programs as well. Thank you. Great, well, thank you very much. Um, I now wanna open it up a little bit to just some general discussion uh, amongst the group as a whole. If there's anyone that's not necessarily on the panel that has any questions you'd like to ask the panel, please feel free to either ask or put it in the chat. Um, but I wanted to start with a question that relates to going back to the overall goal of why we're here today, and that's to try to come up with uh, share ideas and best practices that can really help promote the success of K awardees and uh, prospective K applicants. So I'm just wondering if the K-12 PIs can discuss any tangible characteristics that they look for in applicants or among the awardees, uh, characteristics that have uh, been associated with high levels of success in the program, or any aspects of the program itself that you think are particularly valuable in helping uh, the awardees maintain success, not only while in the program, but that might be predictive of uh, future uh, career success as a clinician scientist. Um, that's a really good question, and I, I think there are a, a number of characteristics that predict success, but I'll just mention one that I think is very important, which is scientific curiosity. So the uh, people who I have seen uh, succeed to the greatest extent are the ones who love solving puzzles, uh, whether it's basic science or clinical science. Uh, we all know that research can be slow, and uh, one has to be uh, perseverant and uh, love the process and love the result, the outcome. Uh, so those who are exceptionally curious, I think, do very well. I think that's an exceptional uh, question. It's a very complex one, uh, Tom. And what answer can we give that doesn't state the obvious, right? Um, in the sense that, you know, once you become an ophthalmologist in a premier institution, already you've gone through so many filters that have already selected the bright and the curious and the driven and the focused and the, you know, X, Y, Z. So um, perhaps maybe we can talk about things that are relatively modifiable because we can't change who we are. Uh, but I, I think just looking at over the years at people, not only here in Boston, but also nationally who've been successful as clinician scientists, I think there, there are a couple of things. One is that they've all benefited from tremendous uh, mentoring. And uh, a mentor is really, really critical. And especially for um, someone in ophthalmology in a department of ophthalmology, in a medical school, in a clinical department. Ideally, you would like to get mentoring both for one's career as a clinician within the landscape of ophthalmology, but perhaps even more importantly, in that scientific discipline. It's really, really important to get solid, continuous oversight, critical, constructive oversight in that discipline. So I think that's really, really important. Um, and I think the other thing is truly, uh, which maybe is related to what uh, uh, Joshua just mentioned, is really, I would call it just love for the science. In other words, um, we should not look for people who are only driven from a careerist perspective, right? It can't be about becoming famous or, or, or the quickest way to uh, become a chair. It has to do with the love of science and the love of knowledge, um, because that's an element, I think, as Joshua was mentioning, that, that'll really uh, permit continuous engagement over the long term. This is a marathon. It's not a dash to success. It's not just about getting your first R01. In fact, it's about getting that R01 funded, not as a new investigator, but as a, any other investigator. That's when things really begin to drop off in terms of success of clinician scientists. So it has to be someone who gets that mentoring and then can remain engaged because of their interest to um, make an impact in discovery and development. Thank you. 
Tom, if I understood your question, <clears throat> you were asking <clears throat> about uh, what, what do you look for in potential applicants? And, and I think Josh hit you know, uh, one of the really important things, intellectual curiosity. We heard about uh, perseverance, uh, and that's often demonstrated in somebody who might already be off the launching pad uh, through doing things in, as an undergraduate, medical school, residency, people who stick with it. Um, and, and then people who really are looking for a career and, 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 and not, not a, a short burst of research excitement, somebody who really is gonna be dedicated to developing a career, um, not only uh, as a clinician, but also as a scientist, uh, because we are clinician scientists. And, and it, it, you know, the, the, the research laboratory often uh, stimulates ideas that we bring to the clinic. And of course, one of the unique advantages that we have is that uh, as clinicians is we can bring things to the laboratory. And so somebody who understands that interplay uh, is often a, a, a very attractive uh, candidate. Thank you. I would just add that the ability to formulate a question is often a key predictor. Lots of people are very scientifically curious, but, but it takes a lot of it, it takes a certain mindset to be able to actually formulate the question in a, into a testable hypothesis. I, I think that that, um, that skill can be honed, but it, but it has to be encouraged. And, 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 and I think that's very helpful in, in the grant writing process. And so explaining to people, what, what is it that I want to do? What is it that I'm studying? Um, I saw there were a few questions in the, in the chat. I don't know if somebody's, Somebody asked about how do we? Um, uh, yeah, there's a couple of couple of questions about mentorship, uh, which we've heard a lot about the importance of mentorship in uh, to young clinicians and scientists and young scientists in general. I think the two questions relate to how do you encourage faculty members to commit to being active mentors for K scholars. And I might uh, take that a step further and ask whether uh, any programs do anything as far as formal training in mentorship or required didactics or uh, whether there's a vetting process for uh, ensuring that the mentors are uh, uh, doing uh, their jobs to uh, the best possible ability for their mentees. And then a uh, related question was uh, the process of matching mentors to mentees. Uh, is there any formal way to do this? What are the best practices for making those connections, especially for uh, applicants that may be coming from outside the institution and may not know all the faculty already? Maybe I can uh, take a stab at that. So um, we have a formal uh, mentoring program for all of our instructors, assistant professors, and associate professors um, at Harvard. Here, unfortunately, the entering position for faculty is an instructor. So, and then you become an assistant professor and so on and so forth. And the program actually is run by <clears throat> David Hunter, also an ex Hopkins individual, uh, who's chief of ophthalmology at the Boston Children's Hospital. And um, so, what we have is, again, we assign all of our faculty, including our K scholars, whether they're K-12 grantees, K-8 or K-23, to career mentors who are separate from their laboratory uh, mentors. So there's that piece of it. Uh, the other piece is that um, uh, in our we have a research leadership uh, group comprised of about a half dozen people in our department and we review all of our clinician scientists regardless of their funding status. And we look at them twice a year to try to ensure that they're getting appropriate and adequate mentoring. One thing that I would suggest all the departments to do, uh, the larger departments is to develop a matrix uh, of 
expertise. So we have one here where, for example, we have cornea, glaucoma, retina, the clinical subspecialty areas. And then in the other axis, we have the scientific discipline, immunology, vascular biology, imaging, genomics, data science, et cetera. And so we put our faculty in these different little buckets. And so depending then on what the interests of the individual might be, we try to put them into one of the one of these smaller buckets. And as I alluded to earlier, we do have the benefit of having also MIT in our backyard. So there are occasionally um, um, candidates who want to come in in a very particular area where we don't have the faculty core expertise in our own department, and then we place them in other institutions. And we've done that at MIT, as well as other non-ophthalmology uh, departments at uh, HMS. Thank you. Great. Anyone with any other thoughts about mentorship? Promotion? Yeah, I, guess I, I can chime in. Um, so I agree with everything that's said. Um, you know, um, you know, as our world gets busier, it is hard to get mentorship. I think um, to be an effective mentor, one of the things that really helps is that the individual be well organized. So to be able to to really be efficient in the things that you do, so that you don't fall behind, so that you do have enough time to do it. Um, I it, it's hoped that uh, as certainly from 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 my experience as I've gone through the process, I've been fortunate to have really, really good mentors and they've inspired me. And I think um, the hope is that we as a group can inspire people not only to be better scientists than we are, because that's how the field advances, but hopefully inspire them to give back and be effective mentors uh, along the way. It's interesting at Hopkins, there has been a move to try to reward mentoring. There's been discussions. It's been a long journey about having mentoring be a criteria for promotion. So uh, maybe giving a little bit of the, the stick, the carrot and the stick approach to encouraging mentoring. So I think that's, um, I think that's an important component to, uh, that should be part of the promotion process. My only other comment uh, uh, about what you look for, for a good K candidate, um, I, I, I actually, and it's very similar to when we recruit faculty, I I think one of the most important attributes is is in is how creative is is the person. Can the person think outside the box? Because it's it's really having that imagination that's going to propel um, the grants to continue moving forward. And I think that innovative uh, sort of perspective uh, is is super valuable. We've we've seen that there are people who have passed mentored case. And we saw them be successful. So that helps to say, well, there's somebody with a track record. The second is the contribution of the potential mentor in the application process. You know, three sentence letters saying, great candidate, happy to be a mentor, that's not a good sign. We also have had people who were part of a mentor team where our committees had to actually remove them or replace them. And I think as an ongoing business, it's not, okay, great, set it and forget it and start out a four to five to six year program. Uh, there has to be an outside group that's looking at what's going on and making sure that the K person, the, the, the scholar, isn't being forced to do somebody else's R01 instead of their mentored training. And when that happens, it's got to stop. And uh, we, we've had K persons being told they have to work three days a week in the clinic by division directors. And that's called anti-mentorship. And we have to stop that. So I think there's there's some uh, gentle and sometimes more, more than gentle policing that's involved in this ongoing process of mentorship. But it, it's somebody who's never had a postdoc on, or, or never had somebody who they've mentored in the past on their CV, uh, that's a red flag. So it isn't that it couldn't work, but uh, has to be watched very carefully. And of course, having three mentors or a team of people make sure that at least uh, two people are helping this young person. You know, uh, Jim mentioned uh, being organized and uh, my Wilmer connection is through Mark Goldberg, uh, who has mentored me in the past. And one of Mort's, uh, one of my favorite Mort aphorisms is prior proper planning prevents 
poor performance. He wrote it, he hand wrote it for me 25 years ago. And, and I've had it in my desk ever since then, Jim, and, and it's really great. You know, one of the other things that we really look for is, and, and, and we might look for this first in our K-12s, we certainly look for it in our faculty and we bring in a K-12 where it's like we're, we are bringing in somebody who we wanna keep on our faculty is, you know, are they, are they a team player? How well are they gonna fit in? And that's the first thing I ask everybody after they interview and speak with the applicants. So are they gonna be team players? Are they gonna fit into, you know, the clinician scientist culture that we are growing at UCSD? Very important for us. And I'm sure it's important for, for everyone. Fantastic. Well, thank you all uh, to the K-12 PIs for participating. I apologize that we're already running a little bit behind schedule and I know some of you have other obligations. Uh, so I want, as much as I would love to continue this conversation for another hour, I want to thank you for participating. If you are able to stay on, there's still some really interesting and good questions coming in, including one from Rajesh Rao. Uh, so uh, if you're able to answer and continue the conversation on the chat, uh, I think that would be fantastic. But thank you again uh, for coming and I'll turn it back to Cindy to introduce the next round table. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, our next round table um, is going to be a discussion with graduates from K programs in terms of lessons that they've learned and advice that they have for current K graduates. We have Dr. Ian Pitha in our glaucoma division, Dr. Alan Agrari, who's in our cornea division, um, and some folks who are further along in their careers, Dr. Amir Kashani in our retina division, and Dr. Priti Bramalu, um, division chief of our glaucoma division. Uh, welcome. Thanks so much for joining. Um, I'd love to start off by just maybe having all of you talk about um, the research that you were doing when you were on your K and how that's kind of evolved over the course of your career and um, what you're working on now. Maybe we can start with, uh, is Dr. Pitha or yeah. Alan Ariana? No, I can start. I was just, uh, I, I didn't want to go first um, if someone else was going to chime in. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Ian Pitha. I'm a glaucoma specialist. And coming into my K, um, I, I had prior training in pharmacology and toxicology and uh, kind of molecular cell biology. And I was interested in drug development. So uh, my K project centered on drug delivery and glaucoma treatment and figuring out ways to uh, provide sustained delivery of glaucoma medications, which a lot of people would say is a major clinical unmet need in glaucoma treatment. So my uh, K training uh, included two mentors, two fantastic mentors, Harry Quigley, um, from whom I, I've learned uh, so many things, but uh, my, he was teaching me uh, about the cell biology and pathogenesis of glaucoma because I was new to uh, you know basic science research in glaucoma. And I also learned a lot about animal models um, from him. And uh, my other K mentor was Justin Haynes, who's a chemical engineer with extensive experience in um, sustained delivery of medications and um, delivering drugs uh, to the eye and other organs of the body. So is, is that what you were looking for? Is there anything more that you wanted from that? No, that's perfect. Perfect. Hi, I'm Alan Akari. I'm in our cornea division. And I think Ian and I started our K probably around the same time, I think 2014. And um, so my K had focused on looking at the genetics and imaging of Fuchs dystrophy and um, specifically in people of African descent, um, which had been underrepresented in research at the time. Um, I'd wanted in that process to get more experience both with genetic epidemiology and biostatistics. So I did an MPH as part of my training as well. Um, since then, so specifically from a genetics perspective, um, we were able to, to look at the genetics of Fuchs dystrophy within the African-American population, but are continuing our work looking at, at, at large families, identifying additional mutations associated with Fuchs dystrophy and looking at genotype phenotype correlations and disease. Um, from an imaging perspective, uh, much of my work at the time had focused on 
a technique called retroillumination photography, where we're able to analyze images of the cornea, where we're specifically quantifying the severity of the disease. Um, in that process, we had taken what was a manual process of counting the dots and automating it. But since then, now we're, we've been working a lot in, in the AI sphere and specifically looking now at applying AI towards being able to add to the efficiency and accuracy of, of how we do these analyses. Um, there's a second component to my K, which was, um, as it turned out in, in the fall of 2014, when, when I had started, um, the, the West African Ebola epidemic had broken out. And really thanks to the, to the K committee for allowing me to add this this additional component of, of gaining experience and training, um, we're able to, to develop a five-year longitudinal study of um, Ebola survivors and their close contacts, about 3,000 people total, and um, follow that over time. So now we're analyzing the, the five-year um, data and outcomes and, and um, continuing to work in that sphere as well. Maybe pretty for Amir, um, you guys can talk about the work that you had done during your K and how that's evolved um, over the years. Yeah, thanks, Cindy. Um, you know, I think I'd like to say that I did what uh, Akron was talking about, uh, focalizing pretty well, that I've always kind of stayed on the same topic and not deviated all that far. You know, my K was uh, mainly looking at uh, when and how people are uh, disabled from uh, having limited vision and also kind of understanding how um, the environment or the task that they're being asked to do uh, relates to that as well. The K award was primarily on reading, although I did in that process get uh, additional awards to look at mobility. And then uh, when it came time to write my R01, actually that mobility work uh, had really taken off. And so um, we, uh, we had kind of developed a lot of ways to, you know, to evaluate uh, real world mobility. Uh, and I think also, as Akrit mentioned, you know, a lot of that, we're taking that early time to kind of come up with new techniques to do that, uh, you know, GPS trackers, uh, you know, uh, waist and uh, wrist, uh, wrist uh, worn uh, accelerometers and trackers. And so we ended up using that to, to look at falls and risk factors for falls and patients with glaucoma. Now, uh, and then that, uh, that study also had an innovative element of going into people's homes and looking at the home environment. And uh, now we've kind of really focused on, you know, looking at how we can optimize the home environment uh, for people to stay safe in their homes as part of our R01 renewal, uh, which we're working on now. So, uh, so, you know, I've kind of like always kept that as the, you know, the main aspect of my career. Uh, I just love the topic, you know. Um, it's just really interesting to me to see how people are affected by their disease and to think about ways that we can make that better uh, besides the uh, the canonical way of doing that, which is to uh, preserve or improve their vision, uh, to think about kind of how we can get into their lives and really make their lives better uh, in ways that just not are the traditional ways that we do so as ophthalmologists. And uh, it's been uh, it's been a great joy. I mean, I think like one thing has led to the other, has led to the other. And I won't say that I haven't brought um, reached out and published in other areas, but I've always been pretty mindful about keeping that main track of my career as the main track of my career. Great, Amir. Yeah, um, thanks, Cindy, for organizing this. This is a really great um, uh, meeting. Uh, so um, my K um, was on the topic of you know, understanding the early stages of retinal vascular diseases, namely diabetic retinopathy. When I was a resident and fellow, I just felt really frustrated and frankly, kind of stupid, just looking at microaneurysms and define and having that define, you know, the early stages of diabetic retinopathy with a single microaneurysm on a, you know, relatively quick dilated exam. So and it was very apparent to me as, as probably was to many people that there's a lot going on in a non mild NPDRI. And even before that, it was just frustrating that we couldn't measure it. We couldn't see it. We called this disease ischemic, but we really couldn't measure ischemia in any meaningful sense until you saw sclerotic vessels. Um, and so my K was focused on using 
a, a real a novel, very novel imaging modality at that point, which was hyperspectral imaging to look at changes in oxygen saturation uh, within um, retinal capillaries and, and uh, arterioles in the retina, and also to develop animal models that would mimic vascular complications of, of diseases like diabetes and vein occlusions and, and kind of translate those models into humans. And we spent a lot of time working. Um, as a result of that, I spent a lot of time working with engineers. Um, and I actually spent a year with, uh, with Mark Amayan, who's one of my advisors, just working on device development um, and trying to apply this hyperspectral imaging to, to, uh, to the animal models. And we developed a um, a human version of it and started imaging humans. And I did that during my fellowship before I started you know, applying for the K and stuff. So all that kind of um, was was fine, but a lot of a lot of what I did during my K actually was changed significantly by the, um, the advent of OCT angiography, um, even before it was FDA approved. And so that really um, was a major, major uh, change in, in how I was approaching uh, what I was trying to do, looking at early microvascular changes in diabetes. And of course, uh, a lot of that is history. So when I came to write my R, um, it was almost exclusively OCTA based with a relatively small uh, component in the, well, almost no component in hyperspectral imaging. So, um, but since then we've made, you know, lots of impact and, and discoveries about early vascular changes before even clinical, uh, clinically relevant diabetic retinopathy is, is notable. So very fun journey. Yeah, it sounds like kind of small pivots and small changes are probably inevitable as you know, you figure out avenues of research that are interesting or what's, you know, um, technologically feasible at any given point. And how, what's your advice on how to make these because small pivots in your career development, like how did you support it, these new projects financially, as we heard from Agrid and all of the other folks that like, you really need preliminary data for kind of R01 type research. Um, so how did you uh, support yourself financially during these pivots and how did you decide like what to focus on? Yeah, I, I can I can start with that if, if that's okay. Um, that, that leads right to, to the OCTA thing. So, you know, the, the way, the way I, I think the answer there is mentors, if you want the one one word answer to that question, because as a K awardee, you may have all these good ideas, um, but you, that's what your mentors are there for, to show you how to do something, when to do something, um, and help tweak that. And so I was beating my head against the wall working on this hyperspectral device, and, and we had a company who had helped us build a couple of prototypes, and it just was not... It, it was going, but it was not, it was, it didn't have the resolution that I needed to look at capillary level changes. And I remember one day I just got a call out of the blue from one of my mentors, um, uh, who, who was also department chair at the time, Rohit Varma. And, uh, you know, it was, I was at the most inconvenient possible time. Uh, I was driving, doing something, kid was screaming in the back of the car, but I always pick up the phone when the chair calls or any one of my mentors. And so, uh, and he just, you know, he had, yeah, it was, it was just like, I still remember it. He was like, you know, there's this, there's this machine sitting in the clinic and, uh, you know, we think it's really important that you uh, take a look at it and try to work with it. And it, that, that happened to be one of two prototype OCTA devices in the country at the time. And I, my response to him was, and I really don't have bandwidth. I, I don't want to do a bad job. I know there's, you know, other people doing this. And he was like, and he basically just said, I think it's worth your time. Just think about it. And the only reason I did it was because I just trusted my mentors. I said, if he thinks it's worth it to call me on a Saturday morning or whatever it was to tell me this, it's probably worth my time to give it a shot. And, and that, that moment changed the whole direction of, of my, my K and my R. Great. Thanks so much for sharing that. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's the, you know, there's the resources aspect of transitioning, you know, and then there's the, you know, the mental resources. Um, and so, I mean, you just can't underestimate, you know, how much time and effort you need to really spend thinking about where you want to go. And you should have been thinking all along. But, uh, you know, I do remember, um, you know, being maybe two and a half years out from our R1, I spent a lot of time thinking what I was going to do next, you know, uh, just sitting and reading and uh, figuring out which direction I'm going to go. You know, finally, you know, kind of after a long time, you know, I had this, uh, 
this idea that uh, that I really wanted to look at falls. We had done some work with fear of falling. Um, you know, it was nice because actually there were some uh, some kind of like some data that uh, some one of my mentors also worked in that area. So even though I hadn't done a lot, I kind of had some you know related preliminary data on it, and I could use some of her data as a collaborator uh, to show that we've worked on it. Um, I kind of had some ideas about how we should be reevaluating falls as an outcome. You know, I had done some work in driving. And so, you know, we thought that, you know, there are some measurement issues that we could address that hadn't really been addressed before uh, that were innovative, that we could look at falls per unit of activity as opposed to per unit of time. Um, and, uh, and I thought, and I had already done work showing that people with eye disease limited their activity. So if they, you know, fall the same amount, they may actually be falling more for every step that they take. Uh, which ended up being true. So, I mean, there's just there's a lot of, uh, you, you need to have a lot of conversations and uh, you need to be thinking by yourself. Uh, some people think better when they're talking to somebody else. I think I know, I know I certainly do. So I think, you know, having conversations is helpful as well because sometimes it's that, that talking that brings out ideas a lot faster than if you're just sitting in a room by yourself and pondering something. So, um, and then I think, you know, you have to figure out what you need to really get there. And so then, then I think it comes to your department chair and your mentors uh, to really provide whatever you need in terms of, you know, resources, data, machinery, like Mir was talking about, uh, to really be able to make that jump in that loop. Great. Um, and and now I'll just ask one more question before we move on to our next session. And this question is probably more for Ian and Alan, since you guys have completed the K more recently. What is something that you wish you had known as you were on your K now that you've you know, recently finished and thinking about the next steps? Um, yeah, sure. So if I, I could just add something to the small pivots as well. I mean, I think it's always we, we talk about pivots, but it I mean, you should always pivot towards some sort of support. So um, I, I think uh, Dr. Romelu and uh, Amir both both when when they've pivoted, it's been towards you know something that is uh, most likely going to be supported and exciting not only to them but but the, you know their colleagues and um, uh, the people in their department. So I, I think that's you know one thing that can guide those small pivots as well. Um, what do I wish I had known? Um, you know, I, I, I think, uh, in, in terms of looking back, uh, what do I wish I had kind of included in my K that I didn't, I, you know, I think, uh, uh, spending time to learn, uh, about, uh, kind of logistics of starting a lab and maybe hiring people earlier, um, as a clinician scientist, you know, I love being in lab, but when I'm in clinic, I'm not getting work done in lab. And if you, you hire well and you can kind of delegate uh, tasks well, uh, you can get a, lo a lot done when you're when you're kind of in clinic and, and not able to do that um, if you're able to do that. So I think um, kind of not neglecting that side of your training uh, as uh, you, you get your K awards. And um, you know, for me, um, I, I do wish I had uh, done some additional studies kind of maybe as Alan did in biostats, I think. Uh, you know, I didn't have any direct applications of that uh, towards my K. You know, uh, the, the didactics that I did was mostly in the kind of the chemical engineering and biomedical engineering uh, fields. But uh, now, uh, you know, I do wish I had more of a foundation and a more of a statistical um, education uh, that I, you know, I had time for during my K that I I don't necessarily have as much time for now. So if those were those are two things, yeah, of the many. Cindy, if if I could just interject for a moment, and it it's great that you're the the first. Marsha and Jonathan Javid, rising professor of ophthalmology. So thank you for being that. Uh, following up on pivots is probably the most important thing that, that people can do. Uh, if I hadn't paid attention to uh, Al Somer when he said, you know, go see my old CDC buddy in the basement of Medicare and see if what he's doing is, is relevant to what you're interested in, uh, you know, my career would have been very, very different. Uh, and I've had you know, a number of pivots in my career, each of which have, have led to 
uh, you know, very different outcomes than could have been predicted uh, in the moment. And, uh, you know, the, the, it, when, when your mentor speaks quietly, it's important to listen loudly. Thanks, Jonathan. And thank you so much for your, your and Marcia's support. <laughs> and I'll add one thing to that. I think it, it, it goes unsaid. I'm oh, sorry, Alan, but I think it, as a, as a KORE or a younger person, it's, you don't realize how hard it is to mentor people. And, and you're just focused on how hard it is to have the job that you're having. So when, when people are trying to mentor you, like I think what Jonathan just said really matters, just listen carefully. Because oftentimes they're giving you the answers you need. It's just not in the form you want. And you just, you know, that, that's, that you got to walk through the door there. I wanted to, I wanted to congratulate Dr. Pitha on getting a almost surely fundable score on his R01 application as well. So thanks. And you know, to to go on from that, you know, almost every regret um, from my K or thing I wish I had done, I can look back on a, a conversation I had with Harry Quigley where he told me to kind of do that exact same thing and I just didn't hear it. So um I when when your mentors are, are saying things, I, I would almost say like, you know, record those conversations and uh go back and listen to the the subtle hints that are being given or not so subtle hints that you're not listening to. Well you you can't say that it wasn't loud enough because <laughs> everything I say is loud yeah. enough. Yeah. Yeah. Alan, uh, we keep interrupting you. What what were you gonna say? You know, I think one one quality that really I think you start in the K to discover that I think looking back now, um, I think is really important is really this this kind of art of collaboration. Before you do the K as you're coming up in your career, oftentimes you're thinking about your, you know, your own path forward. But the K is when you really first start to take responsibility. You have your mentor, but you also have this opportunity to collaborate kind of horizontally. And I think this is an area too where to touch on the pivots, I think it can also give you some strength if you need to explore things. We're I think we're living at a special time where innovation is happening at an exponential rate. And I remember it was during my K when one of my students over the summer, several years ago, had mentioned he wanted, we were analyzing corneal endothelial images. And he said, I want to try to do this with machine learning. And I had never heard of machine learning before. But, you know, he had some expertise, but he had also other folks who he could bring in and he brought us together as a team. And if I hadn't listened to him, he was an undergraduate at the time, I, we would have also had a very different trajectory in our work with AI. So, um, but I think in order to be able to take that pivot and to be able to explore that, it really took collaboration because we need to draw on additional strengths. Um, and, you know, I think right now it's like we're seeing, and similarly, I think also, you know, I had, I had a, a significant, pivot, I guess you could say, or an additional component in my K with the Ebola work, but that too was also collaborating with the NIH. Um, early on, we were thinking, how are we going to fund this um, beyond, you know, just some initial work? And fortunately, right as we were thinking about that, um, Congress had decided to dedicate a little over $500 million for Ebola research. Um, so being able to collaborate with the NIH to be able to, to fund that moving forward has been essential. I could have tried to do something myself um, and we had initially thought to do that, but then being able to collaborate I'll just gives you that support. So I think that's that's one thing too, like looking back, don't be afraid to reach out and to, to build teams and to work with others too. Amazing. Thanks so much, everyone, for the words of wisdom. We're gonna go on to our last scheduled session for today. Um, it's going to be a rapid fire uh, presentation from current uh, K, oh, current Wilmer K awardees who's going to give a very brief presentation about their work, their training plan that they have for their K grant and lessons learned as they've gone through this process. And we'll start with my um, esteemed co-moderator, Dr. Johnson, and then myself, um, Dr. Mira Sachdeva, who's my colleague in the retina division, Dr. Jithin Yohannan um, in the glaucoma division, Dr. Jefferson Doyle in pediatrics, and uh, lastly, Dr. Knuckles Shekelwat in Cornea.
Great. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I'll make this quick because uh, I'm more interested in what other people have to say. Uh, but my uh, KO8 is entitled Human Stem Cell Derived Retinal Ganglion Cell Transplantation for Optic Nerve Regeneration. As a glaucoma specialist, it's uh, something that hit, hits home because when I'm in the clinic, I have no way of improving people's vision. And so I've spent a lot of time thinking deeply about what actually needs to be done on a cellular and molecular level to replace retinal ganglion cells that have been lost to glaucoma and other optic neuropathies uh, to get them to survive long term, to integrate into the retina, grow axons to subcortical targets in the brain, and actually restore vision. Uh, so I have a translational neuroscience laboratory where we grow stem cell derived retinal ganglion cells. We genetically engineer them with interesting reporters or to have uh, biological properties that help us answer questions about their survival and integration after transplantation. Uh, one of the things we've discovered over the last couple of years is that the internal limiting membrane uh, acts as a barrier to the engraftment of transplanted retinal ganglion cells into the retina. And by disrupting that barrier, we can actually get uh, structural engraftment wherein uh, transplanted retinal ganglion cells will extend dendrites that laminate within the inner plexiform layer of the retina, as shown here in this uh, three-dimensional rendering, uh, which is important because that's exactly where you want the dendrites to be uh, if you expect them to form new synapses with afferent, bipolar, and amacrine cells in such a way that will allow them to receive visual input uh, from the photoreceptor bipolar cell pathway. And then of course, uh, we still need them to grow lengthy axons through the optic nerve and into the brain. Uh, so I think the more important part of this is a discussion of some of our realizations as K awardees that may be uh, useful for the committees that are helping to mentor awardees through the process and also any potential K applicants uh, that are looking uh, to pursue the path of a clinician scientist. Uh, we discussed this a little bit beforehand and we all had a lot of very overlapping uh, observations, uh, but mine is going to be that the K award training period is not just about learning to do great science. You know, I thought uh, and when I wrote my training plan, it was very much about uh, gaining knowledge and skills in neuroscience that will allow me to conduct experiments and think of new hypotheses and write grants that develop a research program. But uh, the path to independence as a PI of a lab requires a lot of skills that I think are not typically taught in a formal way. And some of those have uh, been touched on in the discussions of running K-12 programs. And so I think one really important uh, outcome of this meeting today has been hearing uh, some of the programs that existed at uh, other uh, universities, uh, like Dr. Weinreb was mentioning uh, a career development and training program where some of these skills that I've listed on the slide here are formally taught. Things like how uh, uh, Dr. O mentioned this as well, hiring uh, and finding the best personnel to work in your lab, sometimes needing to fire people if it's uh, not working to build the lab culture that you want. Staff management, how to assign uh, projects or experiments to people in a way that leverages their skills and promotes efficiency and minimizes overlap. Managing a budget, not just writing the budget, but actually uh, making sure that things are being spent in the correct way and at an appropriate rate. And uh, finally, just being a good mentor to people in your lab. Um, you know, I, like many people on the call, have had uh, tremendous mentors at every single step of my career. And I think naively, I used to think that if I can just replicate and do the things that I perceived mentors were doing for me, then that will make me a good mentor. And I think it actually takes much more than that. It takes a lot of dedicated introspective thought about uh, how to be a good mentor. It takes reading and, uh, you know, sometimes even like coursework, like uh, Jim was mentioning on how to be a good mentor. So there's a lot of, I would say, soft skills that are not necessarily related to the science you want to do uh, that I think require dedicated uh, commitment to gaining. Uh, and that should be done as part of the K award training program. 
All right. I think uh, our next speaker is going to be Cindy Kai. Great advice, Tom. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about my project, which is very different from what Tom is working on. Um, so social determinants of health, as you know, are the conditions that shape um, people's lives, and they contain domains like economic stability, education access, neighborhood environment, social context, and healthcare access. And so the purpose of my K project is to understand how social determinants of health impact diabetic retinopathy care, specifically identifying the adverse determinants that prevent patients with diabetes from following up on eye care and using characteristics of where patients live or these neighborhood level social determinants to predict which patients are, are at highest risk for having lapses in care. Because um, ultimately, I want to build evidence-based interventions to address these adverse determinants to improve diabetic eye care utilization and um, vision outcomes for our vulnerable populations. Um, so my training plan um, included individual and group mentoring meetings with a mentoring team, which consists of Dr. Zeger, who's a biostatistician, Dr. Cruz, a nephrologist and health disparities researcher, and Drs. Naji and Karazi, who are informatician. And I also included formal coursework to complete a master's of um, applied health sciences informatics, as well as additional coursework in biostats and epidemiology in the School of Public Health. And I'd say in terms of lessons learned for me, um, the biggest thing that I had to learn uh, was to how to transition from a clinician in training who also did research into a clinician scientist. And one of the big things was figuring out what a five-year project looks like. Because I think prior to the K, I'd only really thought about one-year projects. And five years is a very long time. It's longer than the entirety of ophthalmology training. And my advice to um, applicants is, um, you know, just start with your specific aims, just put your ideas to paper. Um, some of my the very earlier drafts of my specific aims were probably closer to short research proposals that were two to three pages long rather than actual aims, but showing that to, you know, Jim's grant writing committee and getting feedback was really helpful in kind of expanding my thinking and converting, you know, a one-year project into something that was um, more NIH fundable research. So thank you and happy to chat offline for those of you who have additional questions. Next we have Dr. Sachdeva. All right, let me, sorry, to share this. Okay, hopefully you can see, see the slides and hear me. So yes, thanks to Cindy and Tom. I know we're gonna try to keep this quick, but I just wanted to say I um, I had the, the pleasure of being supported first by the K-12 at Wilmer, and then I transitioned to my own K-08. Um, and I also am the beneficiary of um, one of the rising professorships that we heard about already. So, um, and my project really has been, or my interest in general has really been trying to understand the molecular mechanisms underlying what's called early diabetic retinal neurodegeneration. So just, you know, very quickly, of course, we all know that diabetic retinopathy affects the, the microvasculature in the retina, but now it's really well appreciated that there are structural and functional changes in the retina as well, some of which occur very early on. Um, and the retinal ganglion cells have been kind of a, a focus of that in the literature and, and suggest there might be RGC loss. So, so um, I, so for the K, my hypothesis was really that diabetes and high glucose directly lead to RGC loss or dysfunction due to perturbations in mitochondrial dynamics via dysregulation of a specific protein called Paris, which one of my mentors identified um, as very important in mitochondrial dynamics and neurodegeneration in Parkinson's. So I was interested, I've been interested in trying to make some parallels between what's going on in the diabetic retina in terms of neurodegeneration and neurodegenerative disease in the brain. And then um, I was very uh, heartened to hear about some of the pivots that everyone's everyone's gone through because I this is what my K was and, and still the overarching question is I'm, I'm trying to identify these molecular mechanisms of RGC dysfunction and diabetes, because it's really unclear, but I've had several pivots already during the K process as some of the hypotheses have, have been different than what I was expecting. And some of the um, results of the models have been different. So um, I think that's definitely been a, a skill to, to kind of develop and, and it's, it's really important. And then um, some of the systems I've been using to study this are listed below. And then I'll just keep on the rapid fire here. So in order to address these questions, um, many many have already mentioned the importance and the value of having a team of mentors. So I, I did assemble a team of mentors from uh, different departments within Hopkins, as well as different divisions within Wilmer. And you know all of these individuals are or were really great um, mentors in general. You know They've had great track records of mentoring junior faculty and their expertise is kind of listed here, really complement one another and I are different, but you know, I could 
could sort of synergize them and synthesize them to ask the questions I've been interested in looking at. And then the majority of my educational plan is really focused on and, and continues to focus on hands-on training because my, my bench experience, my graduate school training was in diabetes, but I studied the pancreatic beta cell and gene regulation and chromatin and ER stress, but I really had very little, if any, um, background studying the retina at the bench and you know studying certainly no experience studying retinal ganglion cells and some of these metabolic um, things I'm interested in looking at. So, so yeah, a lot of my K education has been learning techniques, learning strategies, learning about um, those kinds of approaches and, and neuroscience, and then to a lesser extent, some formal coursework and career development. And then, um, you know, everything that that everyone's mentioned, and I guess, you know, what Tom was mentioning recently about um, how being a clinician scientist is really more than just being the clinician part and the scientist part, I've, are, I think, really important. Um, so, I, but just in the interest of over, not overlapping too much, I was going to highlight one thing that um, I guess I didn't think about that much before I started, and that is, of course, one has to build a team, but, you know, who who you hire as part of that team is really important. So I think Ian mentioned that in the beginning, and I certainly was doing all the lab work myself initially, and even up until recently, I've been doing a lot of the lab work myself. And that's that's fun and for me important because I have to learn the, these um, new techniques, but you really can't do it all forever. So you have to build build a good team. And you know you, there are, a variety of, of types of people you can have to join your team, of course. So technicians, for example, just finished maybe undergraduate, they're really motivated, excited, but require a lot of supervision and training. Um, that's what I've been, have really been my lab composition up until recently. But then of course, the downside is that they do move on to bigger and better things. And, you know, so I've had to go through several personnel turnover situations, we have to retrain people. So then, you know, on the other hand, you could go the other way and go for more experienced staff scientists, kind of who have have more of a skill set, don't need as much supervision, but um, you know may not be as motivated sometimes, maybe. But hopefully they are if you're lucky. And um, of course the cost consideration. So personally, I've tried to sort of transition to to hire um, people or team members that can be a little more independent because that's more important for me. But I think ideally have a kind of mix of all these things. So I will stop there. Okay, great. Next up is Jethan Yohannan. Thanks, uh, Tom and Cindy, for organizing and for everyone uh, for joining on a Saturday morning and staying uh, late. So um, I'm in the glaucoma division and I have a K23 award. I'm just starting my third year. And uh, my K actually focuses on developing methods to reduce the time necessary to de detect glaucoma worsening. And you know, this kind of stemmed from some research I did in residency, uh, looking at the reliability of visual field testing and how actually how many visual field tests it takes surprisingly to determine whether a patient is getting worse or not worse with their glaucoma. And, and so uh, our goal, um, the final goal was to reduce the number of tests and the time necessary to detect to detect glaucoma worsening. And we aim to achieve this via two aims. One was uh, by developing machine learning methods that correct visual field and OCT tests for errors. And uh, we've developed some models that um, essentially can do this. And we've shown that they can reduce uh, the, the time uh, it takes to detect worsening. And then the other aim was to develop deep learning models that can take early visual field OCT and clinical parameters and output the risk of rapid worsening in the future. And uh, um, we've also done this and, and published some work uh, looking at um, you know, the performance of these deep learning methods to identify high risk eyes. So, um, you know, I could not have gotten here without a, a fantastic mentoring team. Um, and, uh, and, you know, in terms of my mentors, Pradeep Ramalu is my primary mentor. And uh, as you all know, he's the head of the glaucoma division. And in my training plan, his expertise really focused on VF OCT interpretation as well as the statistical analysis of the data. Uh, Michael Boland, who's at Mass Ioneer, was also one of my mentors. He uh, has an expertise expertise in data science and was really instrumental in um, getting the data out and helping us organize the data. And then Greg Hager, who is in the um, School of Engineering, uh, is a professor of computer science. 
And he uh, really advises on the deep learning and machine learning side. In terms of meetings with my mentoring team, so this also needs to be outlined in the training plan. I generally meet with my primary mentor, Pradeep, at least once a week, and with my co-mentors at least once a month. And if there's a question where, where a project uh, or, or an experiment where we're having trouble, you know, we can increase the frequency of those meetings. In terms of coursework, um, you know, I have a, an MPH in epidemiology and biostatistics, so have some statistics experience. And so, um, you know, the coursework for the K-23 are really focused on expanding that statistical knowledge with a particular emphasis on Bayesian statistics, as well as gaining expertise in data science and machine, machine learning and deep learning. And as our group and myself have thought about aims for an R01, you know, some of the coursework has shifted a bit to cover newer uh, deep learning methods, such as transformers that really weren't as popular when I was first writing my case. So I think it is important as other people have mentioned to even pivot your training plan to uh, get expertise in the area um, that you will be focusing on in your K award. And one of the other things I wanna mention is that um, you know, as busy clinician scientists, often it's difficult to find time for traditional you know, twice a week uh, courses, just because, you know, you may be in clinic at the time the courses are offered. And so I, I would really encourage leveraging online coursework, which there is plenty of now, um, particularly post COVID to try to uh, fill some of these courses that you're, you're interested in, but may not have time for physical um, presence in that course. So in, in terms of the pearls that I've learned, so as others have mentioned, I think building a good team and becoming a good mentor and manager is critical for success. Um, you know, when you are in a clinic um, or in the operating room, you really want folks that can, you know, do some statistical analysis for you, help write the papers. And so you really want to build that team early on and leverage your mentors to find the right students and research associates. Um, and then again, the K does not provide a lot of funding uh, for this type of you know, uh, team-based approach. So you wanna rely on institutional funding, foundation funding, even other NIH mechanisms to re really be able to uh, fund your team. The other pearl, is to become ruthless about time management. So, uh, you know, when you're trying to balance clinical commitments, research commitments, as well as, you know, leave time for family and exercising, uh, you really have to be good about blocking off time. And so what I've done is I typically set quarterly goals in terms of what I wanna do for my research over the next three months. And then every week I review what, what I need to do to achieve those quarterly goals and essentially block off time during the week to either do coursework or to you know review papers or to think about our aims. So I think that's especially important. If you, if you see it on your calendar, uh, you should just commit to getting that task done within that period of time. I already mentioned this again, online courses are great to try to achieve some of those training goals. Really want to thank, thank my team. If you have any questions, you can email me or scan the QR code to go to our uh, website. Thank you. Great, Dr. Jeff Doyle. Thanks, Cindy. Did I lose everyone? I can hear you, but your screen sharing isn't going through. Yeah, sorry. I don't know. I just screen shared and everything just froze. Um, All right. Let me see. And it's, it just says it's loading, but it's only okay. three slides. So it shouldn't be bad. Uh, all right. I, I guess uh, in the interest of time, um, Tom, you can hear me okay? Yep. Okay, so I'll just uh, chalkboard it, I guess. Uh, so my, um, <clears throat> I'm in, in my second year of a K award and focusing on etiology of monogenic forms of high myopia. Uh, and I'm fortunate enough to be one of the rising professors to benefit from uh, Jonathan's program. And I'm in my first year of that. 
So our broad area of interest from the scientific point of view is trying to understand there's many disparate form uh, genetic causes of uh, pathological eye growth and the complications. These range from connective tissue disorders, uh, various systemic metabolic disorders, um, a number of inherited retinal dystrophies, as well as a number of monogenic forms. And I think what was of interest to me is that these are um, etiologically very diverse disorders. Um, what on earth is the connection as to why? I think we lost Dr. Doyle. Uh, maybe Nicole, do you want to jump in while uh, Jeff is getting back online? Sure, happy to do that. Thanks. All right. So, okay. So um, I'll try to be quick and blaze through um, just like the others. And so I'm on a K23. I was in a K12 um, my first uh, year and then I transitioned. Um, and um, but the background rationale for the research we're doing is that corneal ulcers or infectious keratitis or microbial keratitis is a leading cause of blindness worldwide, but it's very difficult to measure, and that can make it difficult to tell uh, whether certain treatments are more effective than certain other treatments. And so there's a dearth of RCTs uh, in this space, and we want to try to make measurement better so that we can improve um, development uh, and validation of novel treatments. And so the mathematical reasoning um, is that it's hard to recruit enough ulcer patients for a trial. In addition, the measurements are, uh, for lack of a better word, all over the place, depending on who's doing the measuring. And both of these increase, uh, reduce statistical power, uh, which makes it harder to find statisti statistically significant findings um, and differences across comparison groups. And so good measurements are very important. Uh, you want a good measurement that's objective, precise, reproducible, and clinically relevant when you're looking at a corneal ulcer. And these uh, measurements or biomarkers can help answer several important questions like, is our patient getting better with the current, the current regimen? What is the patient's prognosis? And importantly for RCTs, is drug A better than drug B? Uh, the other last schematic I'll show is that there are multiple mechanisms by which people with microbial keratitis lose vision. So there's an infection, there's inflammatory response to infection, and then there are two mechanisms uh, that change the anatomy of the cornea. One is that there's a change in corneal shape, which could be anything from irregular astigmatism to frank perforation. And then the other mechanism is that there's a loss of clarity in the cornea, which is where a scar forms. And so both of these combined, we think, uh, to cause vision loss and blindness. And so we really wanted the anatomic basis for blindness to be the uh, foundation for the aims for the K. And so we're um, trying to move beyond slit lamp based subjective measurement of corneal ulcers to use more uh, cutting edge approaches, whether it's high resolution photography or Scheinflug imaging or anterosegment OCT to more objectively quantify corneal lesions and microbial keratitis. And we're doing this with a longitudinal study where we uh, track uh, patients with newly diagnosed microbial keratitis over time. And we combine their clinical data with micro microbiologic data, as well as serial imaging with the modalities I've just shown. And AIM-1 is looking at the concordance of various mechanisms for measuring thinning to try to figure out what's the best way to measure thinning, uh, because we think that's an important biomarker. AIM-2 is uh, using Scheinflug densitometry to track scar changes over time. Uh, we know that scarring is a principal mechanism, but you know, for an organ whose entire job is to remain clear, you'd be surprised to hear that there's no objective, precise, reproducible way to measure corneal clarity. And we think that's an important um, contribution we can make. And then finally, to pull it all together, we wanna do mathematical modeling to figure out which of these anatomic predictors is most, uh, more, most predictive of poor visual outcomes in MK. Uh, so that we can use these anatomic changes as surrogate biomarkers in FDA trials for eventual new therapies. Um, so my career development plan, um, I have several mentors, all of whom are very uh, diverse in their backgrounds. Um, and to, in the interest of time, I'll just say uh, multiple mentors I've experienced in clinical trials. I have a principal biostatistics mentor, uh, and then uh, one mentor who's um, really got clinical experience as well as uh, clinical trial experience in microbial keratitis and then uh, an imaging analysis mentor as well. Uh, the formal coursework consists of a master's degree in clinical trials and evidence synthesis, and a lot of interaction with the epidemiology department. And increasingly, I've really enjoyed taking microbiology coursework as well. And more importantly than I, I think than the formal coursework is the hands-on training. So there's immersion in clinical trial meetings at uh, the Center for Clinical Trials at the School of Public Health, and just frequent interaction with mentors from the ongoing research that we have going on. 
Um, and here are my lessons learned so far. First is that persistence is key. Um, I did have to revise and resubmit my K, uh, and I think that was actually one of the best things to happen. Uh, at the time, it wasn't feeling it wasn't a very good feeling, um, but it really taught me just just how to keep pushing forward. And my mentor was dogged in his determination to help me push forward as well. And it was a really great learning experience that I think I hope will serve me well for the future. Um, I think it's really important to keep applying for supplementary funding. Um, I am one of the rising professors, and that really takes a lot of the pressure off. But there was a point in the first uh, year or so where I was applying for one supplementary grant every month or so for the whole year running, and I didn't get all of them. But it it really set the tone for what I think might be necessary to keep um, keep going with research. Um, hiring and re retaining staff uh, during the pandemic was a was a big challenge. Um, I went through two staff members who either got hired away by um, more well-funded oncology trials, or they uh, they quit working for Hopkins. And so um, just uh, trying to keep pushing forward and, and having uh, the grit really to keep uh, trying to um, find staff who are better suited for your team uh, was, was an important lesson. And then also just being flexible and refining your research approach over time, um, because the K, the, the aims are the same, but I think the exact approach by which we're doing them, have they have evolved over time. Um, I think partnerships are really critical to success. I've been lucky enough to have a lot of collaborators in fields that are adjacent to my own. So that would be imaging or microbiology or genomic science. Uh, I think it's really important to vet team members and partners and become a good judge of people's potential to be good team members or partners. Um, and also it's important to seek out informal mentors um, when you feel that uh, you have more learning to do. Uh, my one big thing from the learning plan um, that I kind of intuitively learned over time was that um, and this is just speaking for myself, but practical experience for me is much more effective at cementing my learning uh, than formal coursework or didactics. I'm sure it might be different for other people, but that's something I've learned so far um, as a KORD. And then finally, it's important to be flexible yet focused. So what that means is your aims could change. Uh, the exact manner in which you um, evaluate outcomes in microbial keratitis, in my, in my case, might change. Uh, but at the same time, instead of uh, chasing a lot of shiny bells and whistles in different directions, I think it's very important to still have focus on uh, still have very specific achievable uh, goals when it comes to your uh, research output. Uh, so that's all I have. Um, thank you very much. Great. I think Dr. Doyle has rejoined us. Sorry about that. I've been on for three hours with no problem and the two minutes I needed. So I will uh, i won't try and reshare. I'll simply say my uh, mentorship team, I think I've got Don Zach here at Wilma, who's a wonderful resource and very experienced and knowledgeable. I'd um, There was not necessarily anyone in the direct area as I, I was working. So I think for me, one of the things was how to piece together the right mentorship team, including people from outside. So I pulled in uh, my PhD mentor, Hal Dietz from genetics, uh, which for monogenic forms of myopia made sense. Uh, and then actually, really, there was only one person doing mouse myopia research in the US, um, Michelle Pardue down at Emory and Georgia Tech. And so she has been a tremendous help. And um, I do virtual meetings with her, which I think has made this uh, much more possible. Um, I will, um, since I'm not sharing slides in the interest of time, I, I think certainly I would agree with everything that people have talked about. One thing that I never really considered, I thought I would mention, uh, is the role of um, PhD students uh, in a new laboratory. I, it's not something I'd really considered coming into this, which is why I thought I'd mention. So I was giving a secondary appointment in the Department of Genetic Medicine. I was invited to join the uh, cellular and molecular medicine PhD program at uh, Hopkins. I think both seemed interested to have more people with eye research uh, in their program. And so something I was advised to ask up front was what are the commitments to those? What are the financial commitments and the teaching commitments that are potentially going to draw away from your K, um, but perhaps also enhance it? Um, and so really it was only a lecture a year per program. Um, they required you to sit on the graduate board examinations, just one to two per year, which is a couple of hours, um, and interview one or two applicants a year. So overall, it didn't seem a huge commitment, and I was interested in at least learning more about that. And they said, well, and we just asked you to come and give a brief five minute introduction about your work at the start of each academic year. Uh, it didn't actually cross my mind that any students would want to come and join a new lab. 
Um, but uh, surprisingly enough, I've had now three or four rotation students. One actually joined for her PhD uh, and an MD PhD student actually switched from MD to the joint program to actually join our lab as well. Um, and so I thought a lot about this as a new person and can you really support them and mentor them in the way that you need that's perhaps a bit different to a fellow or a technician. Uh, both have, it turns out, been wonderful additions to the lab and I would like to think it's been a positive experience uh, from both sides. Thank you, Tom. All right, wonderful. Well, we that concludes our program today, and I think we are ending right on time, which is always amazing. Um, so a big round of applause for all of our guest speakers and discussants, or thank you for joining our event today. I think we generated a lot of great discussion, and there were a lot of pearls in today's sessions. I know I certainly learned a lot, and so I hope this was valuable for everyone on this journey, from the applicants who are thinking about applying for a K to current scholars, you know, recent graduates from the program, and of course, our fearless PIs and program directors who are involved on the inter on the institutional and national levels. So to echo what Tom said in the beginning and in the introduction, hopefully this is just the beginning of a much larger and bigger conversation as we think about how best to support our K awardees and mentors and groom the next generation of clinician scientists. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us.